Okay, it is 631. So we're going to get started. So the first thing, um, um, so I'm going to call the or uh, this meeting to order. Um, so just some meeting logistics. Uh, if you're joining us remotely, if you would make sure that your um, uh, name as it appears is your first and last name. Uh, so I know how to address you properly. Uh, if uh, you have um, something to say when if you would uh, introduce yourself, tell us your name and where you live, that would be really helpful. Um, we recommend that you keep your comments at two minutes. Donna over here is going to help us with uh, timing on that. She'll hold up signs to indicate when you're at one minute and then at two minutes. Um, and make sure your comments are relevant to the agenda item that we are on. If uh, you have something to say that is not a part of uh, or not relevant to an agenda item, then that could be during general business and appearances. That's time for um, any, any comments um, not related to our agenda to be made. And uh, yeah, so um, make sure that you uh, uh, that I that I'm calling on you before you speak. And uh, that's I think that's it. Um, I do know that we have one counselor who is joining us remotely. Jennifer, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, Jennifer Morton, District Three. I don't feel well, so I'm coming in via the Zoom for everybody. Great. Thank you. Um, and I hope you feel better. Um, all right, so the next thing is to uh, review and approve the agenda. Uh, so the um, I the thing that um, we're going to um, do with that is I, I would actually like to move up the um, item about um, uh, it's item 11, the 203 Country Club Road. Um, if we could move that, um, I think just ahead of the project management approval. So just um, flip flop the order there. I think that would be good. Um, all right. And so, all right. So now, uh, it's, does anyone have any other um, information about um, agenda changes? Yes. I, uh, I noticed in the... Uh... In the packet that there's a, a suggestion that we might want to hold off on the item number 6C, the appointments to the Conservation Commission, uh, because we, uh, because Phyllis Rubenstein, who's on, who's a member, has been I'm away sorry, the can office. you hold on a second? I'm sorry, there's um, some talking happening. If you could hold off. Could you say that again, Jack? Item 6C, the Conservation Commission, I suggest that we put it off to our next meeting because Phyllis Rubenstein, whose term is up, has been away. I just tried calling her before uh, our meeting and just got her voicemail. Okay, so uh, without objection, will you, I don't think there's anything urgent on that sure. one. So um, yeah. we will, um, so, uh, well, Paige, you're uh, on the Conservation Commission, am I correct? Go, go ahead, Paige. Uh, you are muted, though. Thank you. Um, Phyllis is very heavily involved in a project that several of us are doing on the commission, and I'm quite sure that she will want to continue. And frankly, we desperately need the three new members. <laughs> so please don't delay, because um, I, I'm I'm. I'm positive that Phyllis will reapply because we've been involved in a project for the last six months and it's ongoing through this fall. So uh, I'm sure she will not, um, okay. not, not, not reapply. And I'm surprised Thank she you. hasn't. Okay. So just on the topic of whether or not we're moving this item, um, one question that I have about this, this is not one of the committees that has a prescribed number of seats. There I are nine. There are nine. Okay. There are nine, and we only have six people, six members. County Phyllis. Okay. County Phyllis. Um, and Michael. All right. So, if it's okay with you all, let's keep that item. Then is that is that all right, Jack? That's fine. Okay. I'm looking at it, I see that there's plenty of room to add Phyllis, even after, yeah. even with the other people who are. Okay. Cool. Okay, so now we are up to, oh, so with that, we'll consider the agenda approved. Um, so now we're up to general business and appearances. So if you have something to um, say that is otherwise not on our agenda, now is the time. 
If you had thoughts or comments, um, now is welcome. And we'll start with folks who are with us in person. Good evening, good morning. Smart to know Scribner Street. Been a resident for 25, 30 years. I sent this all to you uh, via email two months ago. I spoke to Mr. Steve Ribellini. I've hunted on the property at the Elks for the last 20 years. Uh, and again, I'm asking if I can continue to do that because he referred me to you. Uh, if you're not aware, people have already set up deer stands because elk members have hunted there for a decade. Uh, and I just wanted to bring it up that um, I'd like to know if I'm allowed to hunt. And if it isn't, you better get some signs up real quickly because October 1st is the beginning of hunting season. And I hunt with archery. It's safe, soundless, and helps to mitigate the loss of the plants and such around the building. And that's why we've done that for years. Uh, so I just want to let you know that people are already there. So you better make a decision if you're going to allow them or not. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, other uh, comments from folks who are with us in person. And we will get back to you about that. Um, do you need a decision from this council or do you? Well, I think that is a policy decision. You're also going to be talking about the uses of that property later in this meeting. So we could maybe. So we, and we could certainly add it to the next agenda, the 14th of September, and mm -hmm. make sure it's a clear agenda and that way we can have some staff work prepared. Okay. So why don't we do that? All right. So we'll take it up at probably at the next um, next meeting. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. As usual, I have to take this thing off the stand. So uh, my name is Aaron Clark. I am a resident of Montpelier. Um, so uh, this, I have a, something that's not related to the city ordinance uh, against prostitution, which I know is later, but this is specifically uh, with the motion that was made uh, by the city council to support consensual prostitution uh, across the state. And I know that last time that there was some discussion, there was like starting a discussion of, hey, maybe we should reconsider that because we didn't know. It, it sounded like everybody was saying, oh, yeah, I don't even know the differences between the different approaches to uh, decriminalizing prostitution, like the Nordic model, the equality model, uh, the Swiss model. It, it sounded like there was a lot of ignorance out of which that support came for that statewide decriminalization of, of consensual prostitution. So th the first thing I wanted to say in the general public comments was uh, to ask you guys to reconsider that, putting a motion uh, to either rescind that until you've had more time to actually hear from people uh, about these different models, to educate yourselves about these different models that are out there and to support that instead of consensual prostitution. It's like, out of all these models I just listed, it's the most radical, uh, well, not the most radical, but uh, it's second or maybe third. Uh, there's a lot of models. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's it's a pretty radical measure. Uh, so I would just encourage you to to do that. That's my, my ask. So my ask right now is, would you consider uh, putting a motion to uh, to talking about that, rescinding it until you've talked more about the different models and educate yourself more? So that's my first thing. And I would like to hear an answer to that because sometimes I don't get answers for you know that question. Like last time I asked a question, which is the other thing I wanted to ask was um, last time I asked a question about how uh, how we are not how we are able to not um, uh, enforce a state ordinance. Um, the state ordinance being that prostitution is still illegal in the state. And we had someone up here say, I sell my body for sex, literally confess that right here in front of the whole city council, in front of the police chief who's sitting right here. And my question was last time, how are we not uh, prosecuting or investigating something like that, where, some, where there's a state ordinance being defied so clearly uh, in front of everybody? Um, so that's my question. I, I would like an answer to that. So there's my two. So that first one, kind of a uh, 
not really a question, but a, I guess a motion. The second one is a question. Uh, can I get answers to that right now? Or when can I get an answer to that? <laughs> okay, you want to answer the second one? I can answer the second one. Um, there was no crime committed at, at our meeting. Just because someone says they do, do something or have done something doesn't mean they were actually committing a crime. So no action could be taken. Uh, there may or may not be uh, investigations happening there and it may or may not be happening in Montpelier. Um, so because a person said I, you know, a person could say I take drugs uh, and that's illegal, but if they aren't doing it in a place and we don't have the possession, then nothing happened. So um, that's the so, answer. So just a follow up question. So if so, I so say if you if you wouldn't mind, uh, is there anything more? No, than... that's so, so I mean, he okay. would the inference was someone admitted to a crime here in front of us. And right. the answer is they didn't commit any crime. There was no witness. There's no complaint. And for all I know, and I, I'm not privy to, there could be an investigation. I don't know. Um, right, but right. we can't presume that there is or isn't just from what you know on that situation. Um, and on the yeah. first question. Well, wait, I just want to follow up um, question on that because so that is, yeah, if, I say so, I, if I say I murdered someone up here and we don't have any kind of investigation, I mean, if I say I have drugs, so, I'm doing drugs. I'm going to interrupt you. I imagine there's an um, investigation so, of some sort. So on to the, the first question, um, we I think we are going to be reconsidering um, all of the things that we take as a, um, a position on for state, uh, like our, our legislative agenda. So we'll be retaking up um, all of that when we, when we do our, our legislative agenda, which I think is in November. So, yeah. That's so you're gonna, so you're gonna take that we don't back we don't then? really we don't really do back and forths just so you know so, so I can, oh that's kind of hard yes. to just ask a question and then yep yep not have any kind I know. of way to talk but back. we have a lot well, that but we we can't really afford to do that um, with so many people that are going to want to say things I so. guess I've seen that happen here which is why I thought it was normal so it's that's, not <laughs> I've seen, I've seen it happen. yes right and I'm but, and so I'm telling you and everyone that yeah. we don't really do back and forth starting now never do that again yes okay, okay. thank you <laughs> okay. Thank okay, you. well, I, I didn't get an answer really to that question. So that's well, why. Well, so I, great. Thank you. So Thanks. I would like I have, to get an answer. At well, some point, thank actually, you. And so that's um, why I'm putting that out there. So please now, don't. Please um, that's why I'm just saying that. Yep, great. I'll, and you need to sit down. Oh, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, please keep in mind that you need my permission to say things. So um, if I'm asking you to stop, if you would please stop, that would be very helpful. Um, that is the kind of thing that will um, get like a warning. Um, so just, just for people's, just for people's, uh, you know, understanding that there are actually, the council has adopted rules of conduct for our meeting and they are posted on that that there, I know they're small letters, but uh, anyone wants to it's read okay. what the rules of conduct of the meeting are, they're right there for all to see. Okay. Um, all right. So any other folks with us in person wish to make a comment? Yes. Hi, my name is Thomas Fallon. I've been living on Berry Street for like three years now. Um, and uh, gosh, after what just happened with the back and forth thing, it's gonna be really hard. Um, but I think you'll understand that um, after last month's meeting, it was kind of hard to um, stick around for four hours, right? Um, but an issue that I really cared about came on uh, around the four, four hour mark. And I feel that I, uh, I, I've been fielding opinions from people all over the town and talking to a lot of people but really, I don't know how else to do it besides ask um, certain questions to you guys about this decision and just sort of uh, increase your knowledge and increase the public's knowledge at the same time. So this has to do with um, the item discussing the property under 12 to 16 Main Street, which is this green lot at the end of uh, town that everybody sees. It's sort of a, it's right next to Shaw's. There's a garden box there. And there's a lot of different ideas and different levels of knowledge about what's going on there within the community. I found that out through talking to people. Um, and so I guess the issue I had was that I was uneducated. So I looked up uh, the master plan and everything. And I was sort of angry because um, it was zoned, I guess, as infill opportunities and other places in the master plan where you're considering a public surveys, they're constantly going back to walkable spaces, green spaces, and safety measures. And I think safety is a huge part of the discussion. We talk about that intersection there and doing any building on that lot. 
as something that's quite dangerous at such a busy intersection where visibility is um, a priority for both pedestrians and drivers. Um, so I know you guys are installing a light there, but um, so I guess my main qualm with this is I want you guys to be honest with us. If you guys, if any of you guys are involved with um, uh, the, what you call stakeholders in the master plan, that I, I, I might've missed that, but if it was discussed for the decision about this space, which was part of the study of the master plan, I think you guys should be open with us and say, I am a stakeholder. I do business with the stakeholders and be willing to say whether or not you will recuse yourself from the decision or not. Um, and so I just advocate for people who think, I, I got a lot of people who don't know what's going on, the decisions until it's reported in the news. So I had to tell them about it. And, and so I'm saying that this issue is not getting as much public comment as it deserves. And we all have different ideas about affordable housing, but if just taking that green space away from people overnight is sort of the solution, then I really um, have to ask you guys to be more open and honest about um, your positions financially with the project and how you're going to integrate um, the green space infrastructure that you talked about in the master plan. And we would all appreciate, and I'm finishing over here, we would all just appreciate you guys taking more um, uh, stewardship of the green spaces, especially in that area there, so that people who can't don't have access to um, or don't aren't able-bodied or are sick or elderly have more access to green space within the city. I think that's a big factor too. So I've been thinking about this all month. I appreciate your patience and uh, forbearance with this issue, um, but it really matters to me. And I feel like the public um, is unaware of what's being decided on as it's being talked about on the agenda as it pertains to that issue. So um, I, I don't want to stick around all meeting, but if you could tell me you schedule something or uh, address it, I'm more than willing to, uh, anyway, I'll get off the mic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you raise a good point. Um, it, it was really late when we made that decision. I mean, you raise a, another point about just how people are informed about what we are talking about in general. That feels like a separate topic necessarily than specifically what's happening with 12 to 16 Maine. And we are always looking for ways to be better about that. Um, so uh, let's have a conversation at some point about that uh, to, you know, if you have ideas as to how we can be better getting the word out. Um, you know, we, we, Posted on Front Porch Forum and we um, and on Facebook and anybody we we're we're trying to to get it out as many ways as we can, but that doesn't mean that it can't be better. So um, totally open to that. So that's one thing. Um, as to twelve to sixteen Maine, uh, you know, we could take it up again, but it is also a decision that we've that we've made. Um, you know, had some thoughts about. Um, uh, our financial positions, like if basically if there was a conflict of interest, right? Um, and I will, so I'll just say, I don't know of any of us that have conflicts of interest and just want to check in with folks again. Does anyone have a financial um, interest in the awarding of, of that? Uh, Jack. It's worth pointing out that the city does have uh, an ethics policy that includes a requirement that any member of the council disclose any potential con conflict of interest on any uh, item that we're discussing and uh, to recuse him or herself if, uh, if a conflict of interest exists. And uh, I would say that that's a policy that each one of us takes very seriously because we're not here to enrich ourselves. We're here to serve the people of Montpelier. Yeah. And that's available on the city's webpage. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on, I mean, so I guess I, I would say if, if folks are Donna, do you have something? Yeah, go ahead. Well, just that, that study was done, I believe in two, 2019, which designated that space to be a building. So our decision recently just confirmed to stay with that. And that was a, a master plan study that had public hearings. So yeah, I, yeah. I just wanted to remind right, people that right. that's also posted yeah. on the website. So I would also say that if folks are interested in having more input on that, um, come, to, come to public, you know, th this time, this would be a great opportunity. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll leave it there for now, but thank you. Um, okay. 
Um, anyone else with us in person um, wish to make a comment on something that is not on our agenda? Okay. Um, anyone with us virtually wish to make a comment? You can use the raise hand icon um, under reactions um, on Zoom, or you can just unmute yourself and say hello, or you can turn your camera on and wave. Um, all right, so I'm not seeing anyone. Um, so we are going to keep going then. Um, all right, so we're gonna move on to the consent agenda. Uh, and uh, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. Second. Okay, motion and a second. Further discussion? Okay, not seeing any, oh, uh, Jennifer. Oh, yes. You don't have anything, okay. That's what no, I'm I was gonna. just raising my hand to make sure I got unmuted, that's all. Oh, okay, oh, okay, great. Uh, okay, um, all right, so with uh, uh, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And, oh, okay, thank you, and opposed. Okay, so the consent agenda passes uh, and we're on to committee appointments. So we have three committees to make appointments to. Uh, the Complete Streets Group, Public Arts Commission, and the Conservation Commission. Um, I'm going to just check in to see if any of the folks uh, for all three of these commission or all three of these groups are here. And if you are here, if you would introduce yourself and tell us about your interest in this, um, in serving on these committees, that would be um, helpful. Uh, so just to check, uh, Caitlin Belcher, Ron Merkin, or uh, Tori Roden, are you here? or online. I haven't actually gotten to check online to see if any of these folks are here. Okay, I am not seeing them. Okay, um, Thomas Moholland, are you here? Okay, um, Jennifer Lee Brown, Paul Mar Marangelo and Randy Hacker, are you here? My goodness, okay. Uh, all right, well, so with that, um, Council, what would you like to do? Uh, is there a motion? Yes, go ahead, Jack. Well, let me tell you what I was thinking. I don't really, I think the, the policy question that is uh, before us is raised by the applications to the Complete Streets Committee because it's a question of whether we want to expand the membership. Mm -hmm. And that's not really a question of the individual applicants. And so I'm, I'm thinking that we can have that in public session, but if someone disagrees, I'm happy with that too. It's fine with me. Yep, okay, seeing a lot of nods. That's good uh, because otherwise there is either enough or more vacancies than we have people ap applying, right? So that's that's good. Um, so and, uh, for the Complete Streets group, I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't make it bigger. Yes, right. Donna. The council initially said they wanted it seven to nine people, and I think you have nine okay. and some alternates. It's always just a matter of one of form, and that, that committee is very generous, like most of Montpelier's committees of welcoming people to come and participate. It's very much a, a very common discussion. It isn't a matter if you're a member or not. Um, so I really feel it's better if we stay with the nine and just invite people to come and participate than to increase it and then have quorum problems. So you'd rather go with the with one rather than appointing all three. Um, if we end up having to talk about who then, I might recommend that we go into executive session for that part of it. Yeah, except I think there are no vacancies right now. So these are three people no that are seeking to Oh, there's to no vacancies. Oh, themselves. I thought there was one. Okay. The sheet says one. The sheet says one, but then the action, so then up above there it says there's- a question there's... about award Sorry? choices, because there's no clear date of appointment. <laughs> I see. Oh. oh, no, maybe that's on the arts committee. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, that's on the arts committee, not the complete streets. S sorry, so, okay, on the so under the action, it, yeah. So um, I don't know, Cameron, do you know anything about this? It says that there are, there are no vacancies, and then down below it, it has should one. list one vacant. Despite there being no vacancies. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, 
Okay. Yeah, because there's nine people and three alternates yeah. there. So there. So that's just a mistake. The, they can slide. Jack. I agree with Donna, especially uh, it. I think it's more than a question of uh, getting a for quorum. It's also that uh, how how big and unwieldy do we want to make any uh, any given committee? And the the bigger it is, the more challenging it can sometimes be to have uh, have a, a orderly discussion, particularly if the alternates come to the meetings. And I don't know if they do, but, uh, but so I agree that not adding members unless unless the chair and or the co-chairs of the meeting of the committee were coming here saying yeah they want more people I, I might think differently but otherwise i'd be inclined to say we're not making any uh, new appointments uh, lauren oh and then donna yeah. yeah i i agree with that i mean it also looks like in december there's a spot coming up and then in six months, um, February, there's another five or so. I'm doing math quickly. Um, so it looks like there's opportunity for interested folks. It's great that people are eager to get on this, but maybe people who are really interested could participate for now and then apply once spots start opening up, which is not too far in the future. Okay. Donna. Well, and, and this group does have a lot of community projects, so they love to have volunteers participate. But the other thing I noticed is I thought we were trying to get the committees to have a more consistent date of appointment. And this one is, is sort of all over the map. So when we get into the December appointments, maybe we could try to tidy that up. Does that make sense, Bill? Thank you. So do we have a motion about appointments? I move well, we yeah, okay. make no appointments to the uh, complete well, streets committee. So I'm, I'm going to interrupt there because like an, a motion to take no action is like not really a thing. <laughs> so, but we have these other two committees, right? There's the Public Arts Commission and the Conservation Commission. So should you be open to changing your motion to be about those? I move the appointment all the applicants to the other two committees. Second. Okay, further discussion. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Aye. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you. And uh, grateful to everyone who stepped forward to uh, participate in those committees and to those uh, who, um, folks who are interested in the Complete Streets Committee, I would, uh, recommend that uh, that you still go to to that committee because it is open to the public and uh, you would still certainly be welcome uh, to be there and to participate. Um, okay, so uh, the next thing up is the um, second uh, public reading of the prostitution prostitution um, ordinance update. Um, and so for that, I'm going to um, open the public hearing about that. Uh, so again, um, if you have um, thoughts or comments, try to keep them to two minutes and Donna will help us with that. If you'd say your name and again, where you, where you live, um, that is helpful um, for our, our for minutes. And uh, I think that's it. Did you, did anything you wanna say before? I just add to, re to remind people as we get ready to, to make comment that the item is simply repealing the existing ordinance that's on the city's books doesn't go any further than that. So any that's the conversation is about that issue and uh, and that's that. So it doesn't talk about state statute. It doesn't talk about other policy or anything else. It's, it's simply discussing whether this ordinance as written should be repealed. And so would ask folks to keep their comments germane to that. Um, okay, any other thoughts? Okay, so uh, we'll start with the folks who are with us in person. Um, uh, feel free to come on up and you can form a, a queue um, or line and uh, we'll start uh, uh, with, again, folks who are with us in person, then we'll go to folks with us um, virtually. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Diana Tierney and I live on Pinewood Road. I've lived here since 85. Um, a friend asked me to write my ideas about this. So it's a very short paragraph. When an ordinance is taken off the books, law enforcement has less opportunity and indeed less authority to inspect that area of activity. 
society can only tackle trafficking, trafficking and abuse activity if there is an opportunity to interact with prostitutes who are at the center of the abuse in that trade. Our, unfortunately, the prostitution itself is often the only identifiable sign in the network of other crimes that accompany it. This should not become another no-go zone for law enforcement. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi again, I'll spare you the handouts this time. What, what is your name and your, where are you live? I'm Henry Jean Binks. I'm the co-founder and co-director of an anti-trafficking organization with emphasis on safer conditions for consensual sex workers in Vermont called the Ishtar Collective. Um, I'm just here to make a couple of remarks about the importance and the weight of language and the way that it endorses stigma and violence. Again, we are not here as you all generously reminded us to discuss the decriminalization of sex work in the state of Vermont. We're instead here to discuss archaic language um, that is has been used institutionally to prohibit acts of prostitution within the city. The problem with the the ordinance's language is that it's sexist and dehumanizing bottom line. It's dated to the point where <clears throat> the paragraph speaking on uh, houses of ill fame suggests that only men can own homes. The year is 2022, Roe v. Wade has been overturned and the fallout of that has already become dangerous. There is already a market for unapproved abortion, abortion drugs that is affecting people's health. The 10 year old was denied access to safe ter termination after a pregnancy that was a result of sexual assault. And this is all very much a matter of language and how we misuse our individual moral compasses. What this really boils down to is that the members of your community who engage in consensual sex work are asking to be recognized as human beings. We are not trying to evangelize our industry. We're not trying to bring people's daughters and sons. And because sex work is across the gender spectrum, it's not just ladies. We're not trying to drag anybody into the dark underbelly of humanity and exploit them. We're laborers like everybody else. We're neighbors, we're farmers, parents, we're people who walk in faith, we're family members, and we're friends. At the end of the day, we're asking you to strike down this language out of honor and respect for our humanity um, because we're not common prostitutes as we were told we were in Burlington. We're not simply women of the night. We are people with dreams and we want a seat at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Savannah Sly. I'm a sex worker. I've been a sex worker since I was 18. I grew up in Vermont around the White River Junction area. I have lived and worked in Vermont for a long time. I have worked in Montpelier. I don't flaunt it, um, but that has been something I have done and I'm here in support of repealing this language. Um, the police review committee recommended it. I'm in support of that recommendation. Um, the language, as Henry said, is archaic and sexist, but also I really wanna point out the housing implication. Um, this language would deny um, housing potentially to people who have been involved in the sex trade. And if we can't differentiate at this point yet between victims of exploitation and sex workers, and also that can be a continuum for many of us, and it has been for me in my life, um, this can result in people losing housing or being denied housing. This is a, a, a very current reality. This might be old language, but um, I'm the former uh, board president of the Sex Workers Outreach Project USA, and I have a national scope on what's happening with people in the sex trade. And frequently sex workers and their families are denied housing or evicted because of their engagement in prostitution, but also legal forms of sex work, such as stripping or camming. And um, during the pandemic, we saw a huge increase of people turning to online forms of sex work um, to make ends meet. In uh, May of 2020 alone, there were between five and 7,000 people per day signing up to a platform called OnlyFans to sell erotic and sexual content online. So there are tons of people engaging in the sex trade to make ends meet, and those people are um, vulnerable to different forms of discrimination. And I'm deeply concerned about the housing clause, and I really encourage you to repeal this language. Thank you very much. Thank you. Marie Smartno, Scribner Street. Um, I agree with her. It should be, the language is just incorrect, period. First of all, it's not just the women men, transsexual, 
children, non-binary. I just got a few questions. Do they pay state and federal taxes like I have to? If they're running a business, do they register with the Secretary of State? Do they have liability insurance? Do they pay workman's comp? Do they have health insurance? Isn't it a considered a kind of a health risk right now to encourage this? We got monkeypox coming. We've got the Omicron variants. Just think of what the language says. I agree, it's wrong. It shouldn't be just a female prostitute. It encompasses the whole population. And we're just opening the Pandora's box. If they want to register, be a business, advertise, become a taxpayer, that's fine. But let me share what I had, for instance, when I was in Las Vegas, when I'm walking with my wife for 35 years. And a person walked up to us, handed me the leaflet, wanted to know if I'd had a blow job lately. And then looked at my wife and said, have you gotten laid good lately? I was flabbergasted. And for me to have to handle that or receive that in Vermont, I do have a question though. May I bring the woman that got arrested for prostitution in Brattleboro up here and rent my house to her so I can move to New Hampshire? Because that's my goal. If she can rent my house in a residential area legally and run a business, that's fine. I'll add her to your tax coffers, but that doesn't happen. If it does, I'm all for it, but they better have health insurance and they better have a lot of protection for the community. I have nothing against it. They can all go to heaven. I have no problem with that. We all can, but this is just not the way to run a business. And that's what it is. Because if they are using this to supplement their income, more power to them. We know that people make money under the table left and right. But is it a health risk? Is it a moral risk for a minor? Geez, I might just well put up a job fair sign for her to put uh, to meet in the parking lot of Montpelier High School. When it becomes legal, I can do that. Washington World wouldn't let me. I brought it to them as a spoof. They were shocked. But legally, I contacted the ACLU. I've got a right to sue them. Thank you. Anyone else who's here with us in person? Hi, I'm, uh, can everyone hear me? All right, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm Joseph Page. I'm a resident of Montpelier, and I just want to point out that there are generations that are coming after us that are being very negatively and disgustingly impacted in schools, not only in Vermont, but across the country. And I really think that we need to consider the impact of words, the minds of not only children, but high schoolers, um, young college students, they're still developing, they're still learning about how the world works. And I'm sure that many of them are thinking, what do I want my future to look like? So we really need to consider the future generations and the future of this state. What are we opening the door to? There's a lot that we need to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mariah Infinger and I am a New Hampshire resident. I am a consensual sex worker who has also worked in Vermont. I am more than a sex worker. I am a mother, an advocate, and a human being. I wish to be seen as such. Please change this language and recognize us as the human beings that we are. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for, uh, I'm not sure that's on. Okay. My name is Tom Kelly. I'm from Berry City. And thank you for opening it up to folks who aren't 
member, you know, from, from Montpelier. Um, I just want to take kind of a broader view of somebody who hasn't been following this debate uh, so closely. And some of the things that were said at the first part of the meeting, I wasn't aware of, but um, I think we need to set the bar higher for us all, knowing that we will all fall short from time to time. Um, I think this move, without putting it in context, if it's just as the mayor said, it's just a matter of eliminating it, um, sends a message. Um, I, I think the elimination of the ordinance without explanation contributes to the debasement of our society, uh, adds to the court coarseness of our culture, I think. Um, I would agree. I'm, I'm familiar with um, uh, statutes and ordinances. I worked in the field of looking at statutes for 35 years. And I think the, uh, the language definitely needs to be modified. There's no question it's archaic, uh, but um, just uh, I'm, I'm concerned as a um, Vermonter um, and uh, this is our capital city. Um, it, it's an extraordinary step, it seems to me, to eliminate uh, such an ordinance without putting it in context. Uh, as a prosecutor for 35 years, I don't recall a single prosecution for this, for the crime of prostitution. But uh, the law is a teacher and it sends a message when you take action such as this. So amend the ordinance, don't eliminate it. You send a message to the community and to the whole state by eliminating the prohibition without explanation. Uh, prostitution is generally understood is demeaning, exploitative, dangerous, immoral, and just plain wrong. The sale of the human body demeans both the seller and the buyer. So I'm asking you to reconsider this action. Um, again, let's appeal to our better angels uh, for goodness, beauty, and truth. Um, don't um, condone or endorse prostitution, you could take that step, eliminate the, uh, the, the, the ordinance, but say you don't condone or endorse prostitution and we rely on the statute to be enforced. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Sorry, Tom. Does uh, Barry City currently have an ordinance like this on the book? I don't know. Okay. Thanks. Good question, but I don't think that's really relevant to why I'm here. They don't, they don't yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Thank you. But there is a statute. Um, I might have to take that one. Is it Mary Peter and Zach? Hi. Um, my name is Emma. I live in South Royalton, Vermont. I was born in Vermont, and I am a sex worker here. And I would encourage you to not only remove this, as we've heard before, like just horrific language um, from your city ordinance. Um, but also to consider the fact that even replacing it with something that does echo um, the state law uh, would still be sending a message to everyone in Vermont and nationwide um, saying that Montpelier specifically, Montpelier residents have a particular issue with sex workers. Um, it would be like going out of your way to be a little bit spiteful considering the fact that yeah, after we struck down the one in Burlington successfully, there's, I think, only Winooski. I might be wrong about Does anyone have any better information on that? But I think only Winooski um, has a, a city ordinance in place regarding prostitution. Uh, nowhere else, no other town in Vermont has that. Uh, and um, I, I feel like that kind of speaks for itself. So thanks. Thank you. Um... As you're coming up, I actually have to step out really quick, so I'm going to turn things over to Jack. I'll be okay. right back. Mind up. I'm Thomas Graham, still registered to vote in Montpelier, um, and got a little statement. Um, so, what percentage of residents in this town have ever, in their lives, watched porn? Seventy seems low to me. Uh, all of us who have ever, ever done that, includes myself, I'll allow myself, uh, we're consumers of sex work. So um, does that mean that we condone sex work when it's happening somewhere else? I've consumed porn that was filmed in this town. That's sex work. So are we gonna arrest most of the people who live in this town? 
Um, Cause I don't think we can have a viable town over arresting everybody. Um, so if the proponents of this criminalization really believe this lie that all sex work is evil slavery and inherently harmful to children, then um, why are all these consumers allowed to walk free in this town? Uh, and if we actually care about opposing slavery and especially slavery that targets children, uh, why is city council legally allowing Shaw's to sell Nestle chocolate? Because it's 100% certain that Nestle chocolate involves brutal child slavery in its supply chain. Why is that legal? Maybe it's because these laws, these criminalizing uh, laws against sex work are not really about protecting people from abuse. They're about sexual bigotry. They're about people who can't handle other people having sex. That's all it is. And as a queer person, I know how dangerous that bigotry is. My ex-lover, Fern Feather, was murdered this year. And, um, you know, she was a, a queer person, a trans person who was a founding member of the Ashtar Collective. And, you know, her dying that way really shows that if you give these sexual bigots an inch, they will take more than a mile. So please repeal this language because we cannot be capitulating to these kinds of forces in a modern progressive society. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm Michael Shively. I'm a Massachusetts resident, and uh, I've been coming up here for these meetings because what happens here is going to affect the whole region. Um, in past meetings, uh, we've talked about this, uh, the language, and if the only issue on the table is do we get rid of this language, yes or no, then, then sure, get rid of it. it. The language is unacceptable the way it is. Uh, but then the issue has always been raised that should it be replaced with something else? It's a prohibition, uh, allows you to regulate it or contain the industry, but it is not as offensive. And in those discussions, most of you spoke out in favor of decriminalization. And the reason you don't want to put new language in there that is also a prohibition is because you support decriminalization or, or at most are undecided. Now, uh, I can show you mountains of evidence that refutes the very small sliver of only supportive evidence that ended up in that police reform report. But, you know, no one wants to hear a, a war of dueling research pinheads, right? Uh, what we can do, though, is just look, you know, we've got a lot of people who say they're sex workers and it works for them and they're happy with it. And that's great. We've got a lot of other people who say it was horrible for them and they're opposed mm -hmm. to it and they, they are trafficking victims. We can just cut right to the, the chase, essentially, which is what happens when prostitution ordinances and prostitution laws are not enforced because it's been done. And people can assert all kinds of things that they think would happen, but we can actually see what has happened. So uh, Baltimore, about two and a half years ago, they said, we're going to stop prosecuting prostitution and we're going to stop enforcing ordinances, which is exactly what people have been saying they want. Shouldn't things have just been awesome? You know, shouldn't have people have been not stigmatized and all of these good things are supposedly going to happen? It's been a disaster. And the prosecutor who adopted that policy and said she would no longer uh, uh, prosecute prostitution or enforce any ordinances just got voted out of office. San Francisco, about the same time frame, exactly the same situation, except didn't get voted out of office. The prosecutor that adopted those policies that ended up working out disastrously and uh, this crime rate skyrocketed, uh, just got recalled out of office. Similar things are going on in Philadelphia and in Los Angeles. You can look at other countries. You can look around the suburbs of London. They have tolerance zones. Again, this is what they're saying they want, which is don't prosecute us, just leave us alone. Every single time, it's the same story. Crime goes through the roof, the, the problem gets out of control, the market expands, and trafficking increases. There's uh, two studies that were international studies said what happens under different legal frameworks. And what they found is that out of one study of 150 countries, one study of 30 countries, where prostitution is decriminalized or legalized, you get more sex trafficking, not less. Uh, New Zealand has had decriminalized prostitution uh, for 20 years. And the argument is, some people are asserting that, well, it'll free police up to focus on the serious problem of sex trafficking if they aren't harassing sex workers. Well, 
Guess how many uh, adult victims of sex trafficking have been investigated or even identified by police in 20 years? Zero. Not one in New Zealand since that policy took place. It undermines police ability to investigate human trafficking when you have decriminalized and tolerated prostitution. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ava Ambrose and I'm a New Hampshire resident and a consensual sex worker. The current language is sexist, archaic and AIDS and housing discrimination. We are in the midst of a housing crisis and people don't need extra barriers in trying to keep a roof over their heads. I came here to say that I trust the experiences of the sex workers in Montpelier and support the recommendations regarding the prostitution ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kathy Tarrant and I live in Waterbury, which is right next door. I'm a mother and a professional musician. So I chose an alternative lifestyle in a way as a musician. And I have done it responsibly all of these years and I don't think it's hanging out everywhere in a matter of speaking. I think this whole thing was like pushing sex, sex, everything sex in society right now is, it's belittling it. It's a beautiful thing consensually. It shouldn't have to involve an exchange, a monetary exchange. If that's your choice, that's fine, but I don't want it next door to me. I don't want to look outside of my apartment and somebody's turning a trick in their car. I have children. It gets legalized, then it's industrialized, then it's proliferation and normalization. This is a beautiful thing that's being turned on its head and it's ugly. Unless it's kept in its own place, that's your consensual thing. I don't wanna hear about it all the time. And I don't think a lot of Americans do. Thank you. Um, if I may, we don't get a lot of folks with signs. So this is kind of a new thing. I appreciate that you have signs. Um, if you would keep them at eye level or below so that you're not blocking people behind you. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Hi, I always wish you had a podium here <laughs> because I always feel like I have too much stuff. My name is Maggie. I'm the Vermont Chair for New Englanders Against Sexual Exploitation, and I'm very concerned about what's happening here. I'm as concerned as I was when it was happening in Burlington. I want to talk a little bit about ordinances. They're put in place by municipalities to handle things that come up in their own unique areas. I think it's really irresponsible to just delete what you're talking about deleting. I did want to tell you that I work with an organization out of Massachusetts, and the report from her tells me that most trafficking and prostituted people that are harmed in Vermont, the majority that she sees because they're treated out of state because we don't have resources to treat them are from Montpelier and Burlington and Stowe. So you need to know that, that harm is coming from your communities. This ordinance would be in place, and I agree, re rephrase it, restate it, but keep it in place because these women that are brutalized on a regular basis coming from your community you know, for every one sitting here, there are nine or 10 that are victimized by trafficking and forced prostitution. So I really want you to hear that that's really important. I wanted to speak to this gentleman, um, his comment at the last meeting that I was at, he said, oh, you know, removing this will make it safer for women who are harmed. Well, you know what? I wish you were more fully informed again, because we passed a law 
um, through legislation, it's H18, and in that legislation, which was Child Exploitation Bill, they actually included, apart from the um, prostitution immunity aspect of H568 and then H268, that incorporated the immunity aspect for people who are witness to or victim of a crime while they're in the act of prostitution. So those women have protection if they are being harmed. And anyone listening, if you are being harmed out there, you have protection, you can come forward. I have a copy of that for you. Um, and then finally, I wanted to um, I wanted to talk about what's happening in Vermont because maybe you don't know. I've been researching this for three years. I've been doing intense study for three years. And in the last few months, I just started pulling history from Vermont, trafficking and prostitution, forced prostitution. For every one, there are nine that are trapped in it and have no way out. That's why they call it the choice of the choiceless. So I'm just gonna go through a list and I'm gonna leave these. They have little mini scripts, but you can look up the articles because I left the titles for you. In Brattleboro, just a few weeks ago, um, human trafficking investigation results in rate of local massage parlor. Um, at the same time, another article, police arrest alleged madam in Vermont spa prostitution probe. Those are Brattleboro. Then Bennington, May of 2013, June of 2013, January of 2014, July 29 of 2021. In Burlington, more cases about forced prostitution, harm to women, and sex work. Um, June 2013, August 2016, January 2019, May 2019, in Colchester, July 2021, in Essex, June 2013, in Highgate, May 2015, in Hinesburg, August 2016, in Hyde Park, May 2015, in Ludlow, May 2015, in Morrisville, August 2016, I'm sorry, in Plain, I'll just do this last one, Plainfield, 2018, and I have two more pages of it. This is victimization, harm of women, men and children. Um, this is on your watch. This is a big responsibility. I'm going to take the clips off these and bring them back and share them. Thank you. Anyone else who's with us in person? Hey again. So um, <clears throat> I just want to start by saying uh, just you know, uh, some of the things that uh, have heard from uh, people on the other side. I uh, just want to kind of address that it seems like there's this idea that of uh, bigotry and hatred on the side of people who want to see this criminalized. And I, I don't see that at all with the people that I talk to myself. In fact, it's because I see the human dignity, the value of human lives and dignity of human lives and human bodies that I think it is such an affront to people to give their bodies and sell it. And so it's actually uh, for love of humanity uh, that personally I do this and the people I talk to do it. And, uh, and I, I know you guys don't believe this, but even love for you guys to see you guys experience a wholesome life. And I know you don't believe it, but that's, that's just reality. That's what uh, is in our heart. Now, um, the last thing I'll say is just uh, kind of pointing out uh, what I have seen in this community, people that I have talked to, um, you know, I, not a huge sampling, but, you know, the dozens of people that I've talked to personally, I've never met anybody just living here who has said, oh, that's a great idea. I, I've never heard anybody say that. Uh, they've, they've said maybe some versions, other models, maybe that but never consensual prostitution. In fact, I, I know a couple, a family that just moved in here uh, as our neighbors and they had been they had a three-year plan to move here to Montpelier and they'd been planning for years. They said, this was our dream place. It reminds us of, of a place we used to live. We love it. And, um, and when we got into this conversation, they said, that, that's coming here. I don't know if we want to raise our kid here. I don't know if we want to actually have a family like that kind of feels like it's about to ruin our plans. Um, and it was just shocking to them that we were actually considering doing this here. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people that there is a lot of people that I've talked to who feel the same way. Um, so that this, I, I think that this is going to be seen as a, a sex uh, industry, a sex tourism destination spot. 
uh, that's that's clearly what's going to happen. Not not specifically as a result of the state uh, the city ordinance being removed, but what this will lead to is signaling to the rest of the state that we want these other bills that have been attempted to pass the last two legislative sessions, two bills that were attempted to pass to bring about decriminalization of prostitution, and we're signaling and saying, yeah, we want we want to bring that. Let's do that. And so it it will definitely happen. I mean, Vermont's a beautiful place. Uh, you know, why not go there and, you know, have a little fun while you're here, right? Um, so that's that's what's going to happen. So people aren't happy about that. I hope you'll consider that. Thank you. Um, anyone else who's with us in person wish to make a comment? Okay, um, I'm Thomas. I was up here before. Um, I don't mean to step on anybody's toes here. Everybody here is really intensely uh, for or against the issue. And I think reading between the lines, we can see that if people are justifying um, their choice of career to say, I, I need it for housing, I think that's a huge thing to say, well, where is that in Montpelier? Um, I benefited from uh, shelters uh, in various states, including Vermont. Uh, Middlebury is a particular place where it allowed me to rehabilitate my life and I was able to choose to be employed rather than do it in a state of living out of my car and this, that, and the other. So I think that points to a huge issue here that um, if people feel like they can't do anything else besides um, highly legal or risky acts to survive, I think that speaks to the lack of resources within the city. I'm sorry, but um, we don't have a devoted homeless shelter. It's open during the winter, you have, whether or not you give police the permission or the instructions on how to enforce an ordinance, where do people on the street go and how do they make money at night, during the summer, when there's nothing open, nobody around, they're just trying to find a hiding place, place to sleep. You, by not seeing the various things that this issue involves and making it just about an ordinance, you're putting it all on the police's shoulders. And uh, I, as I understand, as I've been told, they, they're um, their hands are tied legally and to do certain things or do other things. So it's really important, actually, what you guys decide the police should or shouldn't do about people that they see vulnerable people, especially involved in this uh, sort of uh, activity. Um, and so that's really what I have to say. But uh, for me, I, 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 I have to say, yeah, these are my peers here. We have all sort of had to consider extremely scary means just to survive. And I'm saying my experience in Middlebury allowed me to get out of that mindset and get out of that lifestyle. But here, um, I mean, it's a front page issue when the city next, uh, the neighboring city opens a homeless shelter. That tells you a lot, that the people actually care, okay? And you, we need to stop dancing around it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Anyone else with us in person? I'm super nervous, so I'm gonna read off my phone. Oh, <laughs> I'm super nervous, so I'm gonna like read off my phone and I might mess up, whatever. Um, Do you so, tell us your name and where you live? Yes, my name is Tep. I'm from Randolph, Vermont. I recently moved to central Vermont. Um, so <laughs> I have a sign back there that says, um, uh, someone I love is a sex worker. And in fact, it's not just one person, it's many people. Um, a lot of people here are talking about the dangerous and like difficult situations that sex workers can face, but no one has uh, talked about sex workers who were doing this consensually, who were brought out of difficult or dangerous situations through their work. Um, I have a lot of friends uh, who paid for life-saving transitions, um, who got out of uh, abusive situations with partners through their sex work, um, friends who were disabled, it was the only line of work that they could do in order to survive um, as they waited for disability, as they tried to find work that they could actually handle. Um, this was something that gave them those accessible options. And I want those folks to be spoken with uh, dignity and I want them to be respected. Um, and that's what this is all about. Uh, anyway, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else who's with us in person? I'm Martha Hafner from Randolph, and I didn't really plan on saying what I'm going to say here sh shortly, but um, it, it fits with the last few people that have said things. I've done things with the schools broadly. I've been 40 years in the classroom and various other capacities. I've seen children that are, in, are, in, are sex trafficked. I've seen, and my heart really, really cries for them. And things that are you're considering, please consider what the impact is going to be on our children. It is very important. Um, but I also have done things for the past year and a half with the homeless community. I built over 10 units where they're a simple, small little space, but it gives them a place that they can lock and call their own and have a place to be, that could be heated for 50 bucks a month. I mean, that's the kind of thing that I was doing for the past year and a half. And it fits in with what the, some of the homeless considerations that have just been mentioned. So I, what our state has done, putting people up in hotels, if we'd taken that money, bought a place that could be an encampment, put some of these units together, we'd have answered the problem instead of having something that we repeatedly have to come back with and say, what are we going to do? So I want to encourage you both in your consideration of this to also consider, consider the homeless concerns. Simon Dennis down in St. Um, White River Junction is somebody who has a ton of experience building these units very cheaply, affordably, and fits with plumbing kinds of considerations and so on. Um, and I encourage you to consider it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Hi, Chuck Clark, Marshfield. Uh, been in Vermont for eight years. I have family here. And um, I was here for the first meeting and our police chief gave an excellent presentation to you. Excellent. And I was floored that you didn't agree with him. Our police chief. Please stand with him on that. That's law and order of our community. Uh, what he said was keep something in place to keep prostitution illegal. I have grandchildren here. You have sons, daughters, grandkids, I'm sure. And the impact on them, just to hear your, your uh, decision that would go along with this would be enough to further their, them from a, a, a good life. They need to hear you take a stand on truth what's right and what's wrong. And so please go with our police chief. The uh, committee person that spoke seemed to be against him. I don't know who chose the committee, who appointed the committee. If that was your responsibility or someone else, I don't know, but uh, the people don't agree with him, with the committee. We agree with the police chief. Don't hinder him, don't hamstring him. Give him all the power he needs. We need law and order in Montpelier and in Vermont to have a thriving society. Society, our society will crumble. It's going down the tubes now. And so we really need to stand behind our policemen. The police chief was dead on right. He gave such a, a good presentation on all the uh, negative effects that would happen. And I just, I was stunned that you didn't agree with him wholeheartedly and go with him. So I would beg you and implore you to uh, not to hamstring him and uh, what his efforts are here and keep law and order here. We need it desperately. Uh, a society will crumble without it. And this, on the outset, it seems like, oh, just go ahead. But no, it, it brings in, as we've heard many testimonies, as the police chief brought in, the sex trafficking, the drugs, uh, and all the uh, syndicated crime. So please take a stand for the people of Vermont who families who want to stay here. They really want to stay. They don't want to just leave because Vermont's going down the tubes. We want to stay here and have a thriving community. Thank you for my, your time. Thank you. Anyone else with us in person wish to make a comment? Okay, not seeing anyone. I don't want to cut anybody off, but just 
checking. Okay. Um, then we'll go to folks who are with us uh, digitally. So you're, I'm going to call on you in the order that you uh, appear on my screen anyway. Um, so we'll start with uh, Abby German and then go to Amitha Chaduri and then Dr. Stephanie Powell. Go ahead. Great. My name is Abby German. I lived in Montpelier for 20 years and was the main author of this section of the Police Review Committee report. During this conversation, we must be careful to make the distinction between consensual adult sex work and the horrific crime of human trafficking. I'd like to define the two so that the distinction is abundantly clear before we proceed any further. Sex work is defined as the consensual transaction of erotic labor between adults. Sex work can take the form of full service, performing webcam shows, stripping or lap dancing, performance and pornography, escorting, phone or internet sex, or any other exchange of consensual sexual services for financial or material gain. Sex work should not be confused with sex trafficking when a person takes part in the sale of sex through threat, abduction, or other means of coercion. All commercial sexual activity with a minor, even without force, fraud, or coercion, is also considered trafficking. If those engaging in public comment tonight can adhere to these definitions, it would vastly help the conversation. So I think we can all agree that the current city ordinance regarding prostitution is sexist, antiquated, and discriminatory towards sex workers. The city and police department have proposed adopting the state ordinance, which is not only discriminatory towards sex workers, but firm further criminalizes the act of sex work, safe housing for sex workers, and even transportation of sex workers. We need to repeal the current ordinance. We do not need to replace it with a fir further criminalizing ordinance. The repeal of the current or ordinance is largely a symbolic gesture. It will not legalize prostitution. It will not change any of the state laws that outlaw sex work or human trafficking. In fact, Montpelier is one of the only cities in the state that has such an ordinance. And in striking it, we will join the rest of the state in condemning violent, sexist, and antiquated language towards workers. This is the bare minimum that we can do to protect the sex workers in our community. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Neetha Chuduri, I'm sorry if I have mispronounced your name. No problem. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Neetha Chowdhury, and I would like everyone to carefully consider this ordinance update on the program coordinator for the Empower Center, which is a comprehensive health center that provides services to survivors of trafficking and people with experiences in the sex trade. We operate using this multidisciplinary model where experts representing a wide range of disciplines collaborate to enhance services and reduce barriers to services for our clients. And um, the Empower Center came about and was inspired by the equality model, which is a model that was pioneered in Sweden. So all of the policy positions that we support at the Empower Center, it's directly informed by the work that we do with our, with survivors. So we understand and believe that those who have been commercially sexually exploited should never be criminalized for their exploitation, but instead they deserve trauma-informed services as well as criminal record relief. And very quickly, because I know we're not talking about the equality model, but for those that don't know, this is um, also known as the Nordic model, and it holistically addresses prostitution whilst holding exploiters accountable. So it's a five-pronged legal approach that decriminalizes people who are brought and sold in the sex trade, which is people in prostitution. It provides comprehensive trauma-informed medical, legal, and social services to people in prostitution. So this is what the Empower Center are successfully doing right now. It also reduces the demand for prostitution by penalizing sex buyers, and this shrinks the sex trade and it prevents more vulnerable people from being pulled into harm's way. And it criminalizes pimping, trafficking, owning brothels, illicit massage parlors. And then very lastly, it commits to an extensive community education campaign to raise awareness about the lifelong physical harm and psychological trauma that people in prostitution do experience at the hands of sex buyers and exploiters. So Although my work is based in New York City as an advocate for survivors nationally, I feel strongly that any state, especially one that's easily accessible to New York and other big cities, that's thinking about going in the direction of full decriminalization at a state level, they should be aware of those consequences. And some of those consequences are sex buyers will flock from neighboring states and sex trafficking will increase to meet the demand. So full decrim effort 
they ignore that most people most people are pushed into prostitution by sex traffickers and sex buyers who exploit their vulnerabilities. So any legislative measures that fully decriminalize the sex trade, it will ultimately protect the exploiters and further harm survivors. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Stephanie Powell, and then uh, I, I can't see your whole name. Uh, Jay Lee Oshira, uh, Oshiro uh, Brantley uh, will be next. Uh, go ahead. Hello, my name is Dr. Stephanie Powell, and I am the Vice President and Director of Law Enforcement Outreach for the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. I live in Los Angeles, and I would like to start off by saying that I do understand and know the difference between sex trafficking and sex work. I came out and I actually trained your police force on human trafficking. And we talked about issues in terms of having a more victim-centered approach, as well as focusing on sex buyers. During that time, during that training, I was really moved, and I mean this sincerely, I was moved by the expressions of compassion for your community by your police department, and that includes your chief. I can tell you that in order to identify human sex trafficking victims, you have to have the ability to investigate some things as harmful as prostitution because victims of human trafficking don't self-identify. I know this because I am a 30-year veteran of the Los Angeles Police Department. I know the trauma. I know the trauma not only as a police officer, but I know the trauma as an executive director of a nonprofit organization that assisted victims of human trafficking. I have seen and helped pick up the pieces of individuals traumatized by prostitution. Remember, some enter into prostitution when there are no choices, when institutionalized systems have been broken. We need to look at fixing the, the, the systems. You have a police department that is up to the task. By legal, legalization, you are inviting more crime into your area, and you are also allowing the ability of sex workers to roam freely through your community. Being from LA, I'm telling you, you don't want that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, uh, Carrie, yes. Yeah, um, I, I would just like to comment on the, the um, decorum in the room. Um, I'm finding it very difficult uh, to stay focused with all of the clapping and the shouting and everything. And we, we do actually have rules against that. And um, so I would, I would ask that people please refrain from clapping okay. and cheering and all of that. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that. I admit that we had a rule against clapping and cheering. I know that has been the practice of prior mayors. Um, so let's, let's try to do that collectively. Thank you. Um, all right, and uh, Jay Lee, I apologize if I did not say your name correctly. Um, go ahead. Oh, that's okay, no problems. Uh, Jay Lee Oshiro Brantley, um, and I'm the other co-founder and co-director of the Ishtar Collective, um, longtime sex worker, uh, survivor of exploitation as well, um, and also a client of sex workers. So I have experience on all sides of the sex industry, um, which I think is pretty unique for a lot of folks. Um, I gotta say, I kind of had to re- get myself together here because the last comment of you don't want sex workers roaming free on the streets. I mean, just kind of want to sit with that for a second. Um, we're already roaming. And that sort of meta metaphor of roaming like cattle is really part of this dehumanizing language. This is the stigma we're talking about. Like that right there is what we're talking about. <laughs> talking about, I've heard things um, like demeaning, immoral, just plain wrong. All of these things are moral judgments that no person has a right to make for any other person's life. And that whole idea of like using I statements, I think would be really helpful for people who actually care about survivors of trafficking, which we do at the Ishtar Collective. We have literally helped folks out of trafficking situations and put them in housing. So I need you all to listen to us. We would like to work with you. This doesn't have to be this 
uh, situation. We respect you. Ask yourselves if you respect us because we are telling you we want to stop exploitation in all industries, including ours. And there is no one more positioned than us to spot signs of trafficking because we're in the industry. So if anybody out there on the other side that's in the Nordic model kind of milieu who is actually interested in working with other sex workers and survivors, please reach out to us. We are not in this to be enemies. We are in this to stop exploitation from the top to the bottom. The last thing I'm going to say is if we could bring this back to the reality of what this actual topic is about instead of fear-mongering, talking about things like law and order, asking you to take a stand. You are taking a stand. You are taking the consideration and the time to pull out sexist language from your city. And it is true. The only other place in Vermont that has this, I believe, is Winooski as well as Ma Montpelier. So this is coming into alignment with the rest of the state. So I would ask them people to please focus on the issue. If we want to disagree about policy and all that kind of stuff, we can do that. But please stop trying to like be manipulative and confuse people on this issue. This is an issue about this language. When we're ready to talk about decriminalization, decriminalization we can do that. We can have policy discussions, but that's not what this is. It's definitely not about that. That's all I'd say. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, so the next uh, person up it just says Trisha's iPhone, if you could tell us your name and where you live. And then we'll go to uh, Deanna Steffens. Hey everybody, sorry, I'm in my car, so it's a little bit dark here. Um, my name is Trisha Grant, I'm from Maine. Um, I am the executive director of Just Love Worldwide, which is an organization that works towards providing education and um, surviving, uh, sorry, um, supporting survivors along their journey in multiple ways. Um, I do a lot of mentoring with survivors. Um, I'm coming tonight. Uh, this is my fourth time, I believe, since December, uh, fourth or fifth time anyways, testifying um, against bills to completely eliminate laws that are in place to currently help law enforcement engage to support survivors. Um, I am passionate about this because I am a survivor. I was trafficked in Maine and throughout New England when I was 15 years old. I was brought to Vermont. And in Vermont, um, I never knew if I was going to be able to make it home or not to my son. So yes, I've seen the dark sides of this. Um, I have journeyed alongside several other survivors who were also trafficked in and out of Vermont in, in various areas. Um, I think the conversation tonight, yes, we're trying to keep focus that we, a lot of people just want to eliminate this um, entirely, but what we are proposing is just the language change. Um, we don't disagree what, that the language needs to be changed, but we do disagree with completely eliminating law enforcement's ability to engage to support survivors like myself. Had any law enforcement engaged me when I was 15 and being trafficked, then I could have possibly received the help that I needed to receive, uh, but that didn't happen. Um, so I, um, I've been doing this for 10 years now. It took me 16 years to even know that there was a name for what happened to me and that it wasn't my fault. Um, it's taken me 10 year, years of healing and meeting with other survivors. I journey alongside at least a thousand other survivors and none of us ever wanted to be there, none of us. And people have said that they initially thought that they were there by choice um, until they realized the level of exploitation that was actually happening to these people. And I will just end on saying that um, as a 15 year old being trafficked, nobody ever asked me how old I was, if I wanted to be there, if I had a choice in being there or not. Um, and I actually, I'm gonna end on this because I think it's really important to understand the, the other side of this, which is the buyers. I was able to last year run my first, um, my first curriculum for first time nonviolent sex offenders for eight men so that they could understand the other side of this, so that they could understand that the people that they're buying sex from uh, might not have had a choice in being there um, and just really help them to understand where it was that they grew to believe that buying sex was an option, that it was okay to do that. Um, 
I'll leave it there and I'm willing to take any questions. Thank you. Deanna Stephens. Hi, my name's Deanna Stevens. I live in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. I wanna start off by saying that I believe that every human being is valuable and should be valued and deserves a decent place to live. And I want everyone to know that. I consider and have heard that prostitution is the oldest profession in the world. And with that, we should learn that with it comes increased crime, increased disease, increased abuse, it destroys marriages and families. And there are physical and spiritual implications with our health concerning these, this activity. And I support updating our city ordinance language to match the state ordinance language against prostitution. We have to deal in truth and reality and not just what we wanna do. We all have something we wanna do that may not be for the greater good of the greater population. And so we must consider history and what has come from prostitution. And I know the one um, person had said that there's a difference between consensual, consensual sexual activity and trafficking, that's true. But unfortunately, one leads to the other there is some sort of connection. And so I just want us to consider doing what's right for the majority and for our children. We have the power in our hands. When you have the power in your hands to do what is right, to do what is good, that's what should be done. Thank you for your time and I respect you all. Thank you. Uh, and Sheila uh, Bilal. Yes, I am from Pasemsic, Vermont. My name is Sheila Belisle. I'm here tonight to stand in the gap for our children and for our grandchildren. What is decided here is going to reflect all of Vermont, not just one place. And, and I want everyone to know that I do support the updating of our city ordinance language to match our state ordinance language against prostitution. This might be your one and only chance to do what is right. Please consider how this decision will affect our families and our children and our state. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Gabrielle Prito. Good evening, my name is Gabrielle Prieto and thank you for allowing me to speak today. I am a survivor of sex trafficking in the United States. I am a survivor of domestic labor trafficking, forced marriage, commercial sexual exploitation. I am an advocate for women and children and the LGBTQ plus communities. I work with MIFA at the Empower Center where I am the senior peer care navigator. I provide peer support case management, and mentoring for victims of the sex trade. My work has informed my understanding of what policies are best suited to address the social issue of sex trafficking. I'm here today to help you understand the potential harms Vermont will face if you give a green light to the sex trade to set up shop in your state. Whenever sex buying is decriminalized, there is an increase in sex trafficking as demonstrated by a study of 150 countries led by the London School of Economics. Once a state fully decriminalizes the sex trade, the sex trade explodes because of the increased demand for paid sex. In Germany, for example, where prostitutions and brothels have been legal since 2002, an estimated 1 million men buy sex each day. There are 500 brothels in Berlin alone. Men who do not buy sex when it is illegal become new clients when sex buying is decriminalized. A 2018 study of 8,000 US men found that over 20% of respondents who never bought sex would consider buying sex if it was decriminalized. 
the sex trade in Germany increased by 30% after legalization. Sex traffickers lure and force vulnerable people into the sex trade to meet the steady stream of sex buyers. Sex trafficking increased 70% in Germany as a result of legalization. In the Netherlands, where prostitution was legalized in 2000, 50 to 90% of women in legal brothels were trafficked. Decriminalizing the sex trade leads to increases in gender-based violence. Rhode Island, the only US state to experiment with the full decriminalization, ended the practice after 29 years in 2009 because of increased violence, organized crime, trafficking, and child exploitation. The sex trade is inherently dangerous. The progressive approach is to reduce the number of people and shrink the market. Full decrimp does the opposite. It expands the market. The morality rate of women in prostitution is 200 times the rate of general populations according to a Colorado medical study examining two decades of evidence. 92.2% of women in the sex trade report being subjected to physical violence, such as being raped, shot, strangled, burned, beaten, stabbed, or punched. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and anyone else with us uh, virtually wish to make a comment? And you can uh, use the raise hand icon under reactions, or you can uh, turn on your video and wave, or just unmute yourself. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, hi, there's. I, I'd like to say something, but I yeah, can't. Go ahead. My, I'm on a, a tight bandwidth here in St. Johnsbury, so okay. I can't get the video to go. I'm sorry. That's you okay. Know, this has been a real eye opener for me. I'm from Los Angeles originally. And I agree with one of the doctors who spoke and I agree with what Trisha said as well. You know, and I, I definitely want to just show my support that we could take the, um, the city ordinance and match the state ordinance language against prostitution. But I also have a thought too, you know, uh, every woman or man that's involved in sex, uh, the, the, I don't know what to say, not sex trafficking, but sex workers, you know, the question I have for them is, do they really enjoy this work? Is, is a lot of this work a result of the way they were treated as a child? It, can we do something as a community to provide other jobs and give other opportunities for these people? I, I don't know if they're hurting. They could be hurting, you know, maybe they like their work, but for the ones that perhaps don't like that work, but they feel like that's their only option, what can we do as a state to provide other opportunities for other jobs and give the, and give people a, a, a something that would make them even feel better. You know, I don't know if this makes people feel good doing this kind of work. And this is a lot of this is new to me, but I feel like there's something that's missing. It's not just about, yes, let's legalize it or no, let's not, but how can we help people to heal from hurts that they might have? How can we help them to find work that they could really enjoy and and be proud of and get that housing that they need so they can you know feel good about themselves and and not feel like they have to live off the street or they feel like gosh this is the only job I can have so that's the only comment but I'm, I'm really glad I came tonight to learn a lot from both sides and um that that's all I really have to say because a lot of this is new information for me thank you thank you anyone else with us virtually wish to make a comment Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So before the council starts, I'd like everyone in this room, everyone watching to listen carefully. I mean, this is a fact. This isn't an opinion. Towns and cities in Vermont do not have the authority to make anything criminal. Only the state legislature can do that. So any discussion of whether something is being criminalized or decriminalized is not part of this conversation. I understand people's concerns and everyone made great points on both sides. City ordinances are civil violations that are tickets. This ordinance has not been employed by the city in any fashion for over 30 or 40 years. No, no citations have been given. There, 
constitution or anything else, regardless of how the council votes on this, will still be subject to state statute, will still be criminal via state statute. Should the council choose to enact an ordinance that matches the state statute, that's their prerogative, it will not be criminal. It would only be a civil act. So everyone, I respect everybody's opinions on this. I think it's important to understand, regardless of where you stand on this issue, how they vote one way or the other will not change the criminalization of this issue in the state of Vermont at all. So that's a, I just want to set that before they have a discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, I also just want to thank everybody who uh, came to speak on this issue tonight. Um, I, I I know there are really strong feelings on on both sides, and I, I appreciate that um, that you all came to to share that with us. Um, uh, so thank you, thank you for being here, and thank you for um, participating. Um, so I'm going to turn to the council now. I, I have some thoughts, but I'm going to hold on to them. Um, oh yes, okay. So I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you. Um, and so thoughts from the council. Yeah, go ahead, Connor. Um, my my opinion hasn't changed since the last public hearing. I think we spent a lot of time talking about this. Um, I appreciate people coming from opposing sides and there's a lot of competing data, but when there's competing data, I always turn to sources I trust. And in this case, ACLU Human Rights Watch has done extensive work on this. Uh, what's the practical effect of repealing this ordinance? Nothing, we don't use it right now anyways. We don't use it right now anyways. The, the one effect it may have is giving people a bit of a human dignity, which if we doubted that people were stigmatized before tonight, I think there was evidence this evening when we talk about churning tricks and that type of talk that shows that people are not treated on the same human level as others. So if by repealing this ordinance, it restores some of that dignity, uh, I think it should be, it's so antiquated, it doesn't belong in our codes, it belongs in a bloody like Charles Dickens novel. So it's sexist um, and it's archaic and uh, I absolutely think we should repeal it. Great. Thank you. Other thoughts? Jack, go ahead. It's clear that uh, whatever action we take tonight, as Bill said, will not change the legal status of sex work in Montpelier. We have state laws that uh, govern prostitution, and we also have state laws that govern uh, sexual uh, exploitation and human trafficking. And uh, we're going to, those laws are going to continue to be in effect. And um, we, uh, I served on the police review commission and we discussed this at great length. It's very clear the Montpelier Police Department is not out looking for opportunities to prost prosecute st uh, sex workers in the city of uh, Vermont, in Mo of Montpelier. If anything, I think the action we're taking tonight is a vote of confidence in our police department and how they are working to protect our city. They are not needlessly going out and, uh, as I said, uh, trying to round up uh, sex workers in Montpelier. We have state law that, if it's necessary, can be used to, uh, to protect our citizens and public order. And I think the right thing to do is to uh, repeal this ordinance. Um, I just want to check in. Chief, did you want to say something? If not, okay, that's okay. I just, okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Um, other thoughts? Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, um, I um, think that this ordinance is um, intolerable. It cannot stay. Um, it's sexist and it's... Um, disrespectful and just absolutely cannot stay. So we have to get rid of it. And I am, I just want to say that I'm, I'm disappointed and saddened that so much of this conversation has served to polarize people on the side of you sort of making it into you're against human trafficking or you're for human trafficking, if you're for getting rid of this ordinance. And I'm, I am uh, just personally, um, deeply opposed to 
human trafficking of any kind and sexual exploitation of any kind, I recognize it's an enormous problem. Um, I know a fair amount about this and um, and I know that there are many, many, many people who are being exploited, who are being coerced, who are being harmed, who are subject to violence. And uh, it is a huge problem. And we absolutely are not doing enough to address that problem. Keeping this ordinance will do nothing to help victims of sex trafficking and victims of sexual exploitation. So I'd like to get rid of the ordinance. I would like also to get rid of sex trafficking. And that's a different question for a different time. Yeah, um, other thoughts here, team? Oh, Jennifer, go ahead. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I really just want to echo what Connor said. I mean, Connor, you nailed it for me. Um, I, I feel very saddened that, um, there's been so much focus on, um, you're a bad person if you support this, or you're a good person if you support that. Um, this is just about changing language. We're not trying to legalize anything. We don't have that power. Um, we're city council, small little, small little town, city council. Um, I appreciate the interest um, from people from out of state. I think that's great. Um, but we're talking about language here. And um, I've had about 20 years experience working with sex workers and I just, my mind is blown at some of the things I've heard surrounding this topic. And I, I just really hope people are hearing what, what we're saying, what city council is trying to say and where our hearts are. And our hearts are with protecting all of our citizens. And that includes our sex workers that are our neighbors. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just really disappointed in some of the things that I've heard over this. So that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, other thoughts? Uh, yeah, Lauren, go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I very much agree with what the other counselors have been saying, you know, appreciate all of the attention and input at the end of the day. I think we absolutely have to get rid of this horrific language that's dehumanizing, stigmatizing. And so I think that's absolutely the right thing to do. And I'm glad that it sounds like that's uh, the direction that we're likely headed. Um, I think some of the broader issues, um, you know, there's there's a legislative process, uh, the state house right down the road, uh, where I think, you know, many of the issues that were brought up tonight should rightly be hashed out. Um, and, you know, very much, you know, protecting victims of human trafficking and sexual exploitation, which all of us here um, in this council, I've heard everyone speak to, of course, that we want to, um, you know, protect people in our community and in our state. Um, so I think that conversation, you know, should absolutely happen of what are the best ways that we can be doing that as a state um, for state policy. Um, and here today, let's get rid of this um, uh, archaic, sexist, and stigmatizing language in our own ordinances. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I want to just uh, appreciate that something, what you said, Carrie, about, you know, absolutely abhor, uh, yeah, I suppose that's my word, uh, human trafficking. Like that is, oh, I think we can all agree that that it's terrible and wrong. Um, and so one of the things that I would love to chat with folks about at some point, probably not right now, um, but, you know, for those who, uh, you know, came out of that um, you know, we, we've heard from a, a number of folks who shared their experiences, and I'm so um, really grateful that people were willing to be vulnerable and um, and share that, because um, I'm, I'm sure that's hard. Um, but, you know, from from all, all sides of, of the spectrum, um, you know, are our... our um, 
I guess this is maybe a conversation at, at the state level, but um, do you feel like our, our laws are sufficient to address human trafficking? And if there are spaces where it could be better, like that would be really good to know. Um, if it's sufficient, then okay. But if it's not, let's have that conversation. Um, you know, what would have helped to get folks out of out of coercive situations um, faster, sooner, uh, more effectively? Um, you know, that that's a conversation that I'm interested in having. Um, while consensual sex work, you know, fair enough. <laughs> um, and uh, clearly, we are taking this. Um, I, I think it's going to be clear that we're we're going to repeal this language. Um, but I'm interested in continuing the conversation about how we better address human trafficking um, in our community um, and including all voices in that conversation. Um, so I guess I'll I'll leave that there. Um, I think if we're going to move forward with repealing, which I think is the consensus probably. Um, I think we need a motion, unless there's folks that have other thoughts that they would like to share. Yeah, Connor. Yeah, I'll move we repeal sections 11706 and 11707 of the Code of Ordinances. Second. Okay, further discussion? Okay, um, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 I saw you there, Jennifer. I got you. Um, okay, and and opposed. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone um, who participated in this. This was um, a hard but important conversation. Um, and I think actually at this point it's eight sixteen. I know we're a little bit early for a break, but I think we probably should. Um, so we're going to take a break right now, uh, eight seventeen. So we'll be back uh, eight twenty seven. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hey team, I'm, we're going to jump back in and I actually just want to check to see if anybody is with us in person or virtually for the uh, first reading of the parklet ordinance. Is anyone here for that? Okay, so um, let's move that till after the um, to 203 Country Club Road, a project manager recommendation. Um, so we'll we'll see if, hopefully we have time for that, but uh, just in case we don't, that's at the end. Uh, okay, so we are gonna move to the uh, State Street Combined Sewer Water Overflow public hearing. So I am gonna officially open a public hearing, but I assume that, um, Kurt, you would like to say something about this. So just a just a quick overview of the project. Of, this is a State Street um, Combined Sewer Separation Project. Uh, the project limits are from 100 State Street to 120. This is down near the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, this project's funded through the State Clean Water State Revolving Loan Fund. And um, as, as part of that funding requirement, uh, there's an environmental review. The state has posted a notice of intent um, for public comment. Um, that this project um, uh, has a, a finding of no significant impact. Um, and that relates to environmental impacts, including um, air quality, water quality, wetlands, um, wildlife and endangered species, and historic preservation. Um, the one uh, category that is impacted is uh, floodplains, because we're in the floodplain for the project. Um, we will temporarily be impacting the floodplain, but once the project is complete, uh, the grades will be restored, so um, no long-term impact. Um, the project has environmental impacts through removing a dip in the sewer main um, to reduce surcharging, and also um, it eliminates a large combined area of stormwater behind the Vermont Mutual building. Um, so um, really, this is just an opportunity for the public to um, comment on any concerns with issuing a... Uh, a, a letter of no significant impact um, and to allow the project to go forward. We do hope to bid this project um, uh, in the coming weeks and uh, either construct it this fall or early next spring. Um, and just a side note, we also uh, were awarded um, $532,000 of ARPA, uh, state ARPA grant money for this project. And uh, we have a request in under the comment period to um, reallocate a small amount from East State Street to fully fund 
um, this project through grant money. So it'll be, if the estimate is about 650,000 total. Um, so we are hoping, expecting a full grant fund for this project. So from now, open it up to any public comment. Okay. Um, I want to um, clarify one thing, which is, uh, I know this is called a finding of no significant impact, but would it be fair to say that it is equally as well a finding of no negative significant impact or not negative or significant negative impact or negative impact at all because it seems like there's going to be an impact but it's all good is that fair yes i think that's an accurate statement okay yes. okay <laughs> just like this isn't going to change anything like, why are we doing it okay <laughs> okay uh, yes, Donna. Sort of my point. I'm so glad to see this project. It'll be great to have the CSO address, but the whole bridge is just wonderful. Yeah. I think you have to open the public. Oh, I did. Okay. I did, right? Yes, yeah. I think I did. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's okay. No worries. Until she closes up. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Any comments from folks who are with us in person? Okay. Any comments from folks who are with us digitally? Okay, not seeing any anything. I'm psyched for this project. Thank you for all of your work. Please pass on my thanks to everyone um, that's involved. Um, okay, we're going to close. Oh, we, oh we, I can close the public hearing. And anyone else want to say anything as part of the public, digitally, in person? Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing. Lauren. One quick question. Don't worry, there's no pee um, No, this is this is um, this is uh, really exciting. I guess my only question was just with this, the ARPA funds and the infrastructure funds. Are we like able to expedite our CSO projects, or is this just kind of helping us get state, really federal funding to cover what was planned anyway? Are we like getting our CSO problem solved any quicker due to federal funds? Uh, so this was a planned project uh, so that we have a, the city has a long-term control plan that identifies um, you know the major projects that we plan for CSO elimination um, what it will do is because we have ARPA funding for this project will free up um, you know uh, local money for other projects in the future so I, you know I do think overall we'll we'll get there a little bit faster yeah. great uh, Jack so it's what is the action that is expected of us tonight? Do we need to vote to approve this or does it just happen unless we vote to disapprove it? You really just needed to conduct a public hearing for the record, so you've done that. Okay. So you don't need a vote of any kind. Okay, wow. Any further thoughts folks wanna share? Take more praise. <laughs> it's been a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, well, thank you so much. And uh, I think we're gonna move on. All right. Um, all right, so we flipped the order of these. So now we are up to uh, talking about uh, the, uh, we'll have a, a presentation from the hub group uh, about the 203 Country Club Road uh, project. And as I understand it, I think there, you all may have a presentation. Is that correct? Okay. So you all uh, recall that we made a presentation at the last council meeting. Uh, today we're just going to make a very short presentation. We have an update and some some changes in what we're requesting from the city council. I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourselves, Sorry. and that's fine. And then I think, yeah, we uh, if you would. I, I mean, I could hear you well, but I couldn't tell if it was coming through the microphone. So just be sure to speak into the microphone, that's all. Sure. Thank you. My name is Ethan Atkin. I'm the board chair of the Hub. And we made a presentation to the city council at the last meeting. Um, and uh, the decision was tabled to this meeting. And we just wanted to update 
in this presentation, update our request to the city council. It's a little bit different from what we had asked for at the last meeting. And uh, this is. And I'm Dan Bojan um, at, of Elm Street in Montpelier and a board member of the hub. Uh, so uh, what we're here to represent on is our request for uh, engaging into a memorandum of understanding or allowing the uh, the administration to, to uh, enter into such an agreement. We are seeking a short-term lease uh, of the vacant portions of the clubhouse at 203, 203 Country Club Lane uh, Road, whatever that is up there. Um, and uh, basically what the, about half of the building is currently vacant um, from tenants now. Um, sure. Sorry about that. Um, and a small portion of the adjacent grounds, meaning the immediate exterior area. Uh, so things like a playground and that kind of thing, some lawn games or sorts of uh, uh, improvements could be made, not a significant area at the site uh, under the short term. Um, we would like to be involved in the planning process. And I know, you know, as a, uh, we could certainly participate as much as the public can, but we're hoping to have a little bit higher status of that process. Uh, and specifically for those uses that are proposed for recreation up at the, the property. And we would like to have a, understand a mutual hope and intent, and that's kind of a funny phrase, but a mutual, uh, hope and intent for a longer term lease for the future, uh, for the building site and outdoor, um, and exterior areas to support outdoor programs. Uh, we're thinking something in the neighborhood of three to eight acres. Um, the location and the size is to be determined and would, uh, through the intended planned public planning process. Uh, so what this would allow uh, is for us to enter into a soft opening of, of the facility. Uh, we know that there's a, a range of social and recreational activities that we could uh, start up uh, almost immediately um, at, at the site. Uh, they could um, certainly be, would be further supported by renovations of the, of the building, but um, I think it's, it would be in the benefit of, of the project in general to have some more activity at the, at the property while the planning process is, is initiated and proceeds. Uh, we would be providing rental income to the city for currently vacant space, and, it, and this is a big one, would allow for the hub to gain financing for the renovations having, having this agreement. Uh, some of the uh, us thought we should have a little bit of a statement on some clarifications that uh, following our last presentation to make sure that the, some of our intentions are, are known. Uh, during the MOU, we would just lease the currently vacant space, not the entire building. There's, there's three existing tenants that are up there that whose lease, leases are privately held by the city currently. Um, and we acknowledge that the results of the planning process would take precedent for any future development, including the portions of the property that we would be occupying during the short-term lease. Um, then we also in, expect that the city will establish through its own planning process what services they intend to provide uh, and how those are structured for both costs or not, or either under a a fee structure or not um, under to users or taxpayers. Um, and that is, you know, for, for this, this board uh, council and uh, the planning process to establish. It's not uh, on us to establish that. And the hub is, I, this is something I think came up in some of the comments last time is that the hub is, is a component of a greater recreational focus for the property. Meaning, you know, our activities aren't the only things to be developed at the site. Uh, we fully expect uh, you know, some of the other greater thoughts of recreational focus up there, be it uh, uh, ball, ball sports of any kind or you name it, there's all sorts of different possibilities, sledding hills I've heard of and these other things. These are, what we're proposing is strictly to be a, a complement to that greater recreational focus for the property. Uh, that's actually the entire presentation. So it's a pretty short gig.
Okay. Um, yes, Jack, go ahead. I wonder if uh, it might be appropriate to also have the have a, a very brief uh, exposition from the city of the other uh, potential uses for the property that, uh, that have been identified as part of the city. Um, Bill, would you want to talk at, at all about that? About potential city uses? Yeah. Well, we did, you know, we put those together, actually camera and assemble that. Would you mind going over that? You think you're more familiar with it than I am, but. I do not mind. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, also, if we can yes. uh, unshare the screen, that would be useful. So I just know if there's folks wanting to speak. Uh, yes, comment. If, am, I, am I supposed to comment now? I want to comment about this, but am I supposed to comment now or are you early enough? That's a great question. Um, let's do comments. I mean, we're, we're holding on a second right now, right? Um, since there's fewer of us, we can be, I think, a little bit less formal. If you would like to come speak now, that would be okay. It's going to be my, great. This is my first city council meeting ever, and I got to say, it was so exciting. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so so nothing you can say is going to be. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. It's going to be since, um, uh, so let me know if I'm not um, speaking uh, well enough. My name is uh, Darian McElwain. I'm actually a resident of Callis, but I have um, property in Montpelier. My daughter, um, started high school at U32, but now she is transferring over to Montpelier and she's very, very excited. And I'm here to um, provide my very strong uh, support for the hub and what they've been trying to do. Um, personally, I'm gonna tell you my experience. I, I'm a long-term tennis player and I've been involved with um, coaching kids. My daughter was number one for U30, or for U32 this year as a freshman, and that was really exciting. Um, and my experience uh, with First and Fitness, there used to be four tennis courts there and they were always full. And you would see kids from five years old to literally people who were 95. And I think I actually played with this woman who was a hundred years old and she was darn good. You know, she was, she was very, very good. Um, since First and Fitness is no longer um, First and Fitness, we are down to one tennis court that doesn't have, there's not enough time um, for kids to play. And I, what I wanna say is that there locally, there are three high schools, three local high schools that were using those tennis courts and have tennis teams. So that six teams, if you count the boys as one and the girls as one, that would be Spalding, Montpelier, and U32. Um, those kids who play on those teams um, now don't have access to playing during the winter. There's like, uh, there's one guy who teaches one uh, clinic a week. So the kids who can afford it are now driving all the way up to Stowe to go to the, I think I can't remember what's up there, the Rackets Edge. And then some of the other kids uh, who um, have more funds and also can drive more are going to Burlington. So that leaves a lot of kids without a place to play. Um, so, and it, and six sport teams. So um, I, I've been up there at the property. I'm really excited about what everybody's put together. I think that if we were able to get people into the existing buildings that it would really prevent those buildings from falling apart. Um, and I'm also supportive of many of the other suggestions I've heard during these different meetings. Um, but I'm really excited for the kids to play. I believe that uh, tennis in particular is um, an inexpensive sport and it's a lifelong sport. Uh, you know, the kids start out young and they can play all the time. Um, so it's a different kind of sport than say football or, um, or skiing, which is a little bit more expensive. Um, okay, so that, that's all I wanna say. Um, I'm really, really excited about about this and I'm really excited about the recreation for Montpelier. It would really be a huge service to all of central Vermont and to the three local high schools here. So thank you very much. Thank you. And you did a good job.
Okay. Um, you know, if folks, if uh, members of the public have comments as we go along, um, just um, let us know. Uh, okay, Cameron. Hi. Hi. Yes. I'm Cameron Niedermeyer. I'm the Assistant City Manager. Thank you for letting me talk to you today. So I am going to start with some of the ideas that um, our recreation and parks departments have really honed in on, on things that we could do immediately that have low impact to the land and don't lock the land into use for anything outside of our master planning process, which is our focus. Um, we have ideas already to start youth soccer and other rec and park programming in the fields as they exist right now. There's multiple flat fields there that are perfect size for youth soccer. We look forward to taking care of the grass, cutting that down and lining that so that children can play soccer. There's new opportunities to put benches that we already own in those locations to really support um, bringing um, people immediately to those fields. Um, Right now, our soccer season is just starting to register and get started soon. So um, we would only be making minor investments to bring temporary activities in as well. Um, I've heard disc golf, we're pricing that out now to see if that could fit within our current budget. And um, we're definitely gonna have a sledding hill in the winter. So um, the parks department has also noted their need for space to continue their outdoor summer camps and have been using the indoor space for inclement weather shelter through the summer already. So that's already happened and we're looking forward to bringing more fall programming up there. Um, we also know that there are some buildings in existence currently. Um, there are garages up there, which are great. We have a really small rec garage currently. So we intend as soon as, um, the previous owners are able to move some of their property off of those um, equipment barns. We will be moving into those. Uh, we've also already received multiple requests for renting the property, which we are happy to accommodate right now. Um, it is a little limited. Uh, we are still pending on writing a policy for how rentals in that space should be handled. Um, but we are currently sort of using our rec department rates to sort of get people up there and involved. So there are going to be events up there already, um, getting folks into um, the land and really seeing what we have. Um, so those are some of the per non-permanent um, uh, ideas that we had for the space. Um, when it comes to inside of the building, um, there's, very, there's a few bits of the property that are in pretty rough shape. It's not uh, safe for use. Um, However, they do have a kitchen that has a large freezer and our Meals on Wheels program would like to be able to access that freezer because right now we're having a problem being able to stock our fresh veggies because all of the frozen food needs to stay in our freezers. And so we're, we're running through fresh veggies faster than um, people can eat them. Uh, the jokes about zucchini overflow in Vermont is true and we just have so much. So um, a new fridge space would be great for that. Um, there's other uses that we could use inside the building. I know childcare is a huge and important priority of the councils. I will say right now, as our funding stands, we don't, we couldn't do that on our own. And if like renovate that building to, um, accommodate infant or childcare right now, if we're aiming for that now and not if the lease is over with the current school and that, you know, is up to negotiation and up to policy decisions from the council, um, if I can editorialize for a second, I think it's important to reserve as much space as possible from permanence and permanent decisions or things that could become permanent as we have yet to go through a planning process, which is why the recreation and parks departments have really focused on short-term uses that can be easily removed. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jack. Thanks, Cameron. Um, what I'm interested in is whether the uh, the realistically anticipated uses for the city would be uh, compatible with the uh, the hub's proposed use of the building, or whether you'd have to make a choice uh, in the short term. I think. If you're asking for my opinion on that, 
Um, they have some really interesting and useful ideas for the inside of the building that I think are great and well worth collaborating on. Um, I think it would come down to discussing it with what y'all would want to see. Um, personally, I have reservations about um, changing anything externally um, because I, I really want to see what is best use from a master plan. Thanks. And of course, yes, I am asking for your opinion. We, we, I value your opinion. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, other questions uh, for any of these folks or comments? I think we can dive into, uh, unless, but do you have any thoughts that you would like to share? I, I mean, I'm not sure that there's many more members of the public um, that want to weigh in in person. Uh, let me just check. Is there anybody um, online who would like to um, share thoughts? Uh, Peter Kilman, go ahead. So, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Peter Kelman, Montpelier. So when the city first proposed a bond issue to purchase the Elks Club property, it was first positioned as a potential recreational space, if, we remember, if I remember correctly. And I was among the first of a number of people to suggest that serious consideration be given to using the property for much needed housing, ranging from low income to workforce to missing middle to market rate. However, I'm also keenly aware that any and all housing development, as well as recreational use, will require significant financial investment from both public and private entities, like the hub, like Habitat for Humanity, like private developers. And this is why I actually am strongly in favor of the hub proposal to negotiate a short-term lease for space in the existing building along with the three other tenants who are already in place and alongside of the use, some of the uses that Cameron went through. And also for them to participate in the public planning process to deliver a range of recreational options that they could you know, work with the city. This is what the city wants to do. This is what we'll do. Make a very, could make a very, very strong recreational uh, offering there. We're gonna need all the private and public investment we can to attract development of housing and recreation and recreation on the property. We know from years of, 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 of barriers to housing, there's gotta be incentives for people to come here, developers to come here and build when they can make more money building in Burlington, building in Chittenden County. This would attract those kind of developers and again, the full range of development. The hub would bring rental income. They would make a significant investment in the property. They would provide recreation options that the city might not otherwise provide, like tennis. And they would create facilities that I believe would attract developers to build homes for people, again, on a range of incomes that are near recreational, uh, options and natural uh, beauty options, um, the woods and, and so forth. So despite my very, very strong uh, hope that we will see lots of housing up there, I believe that the hub's uh, request is a good one and I urge the council to follow it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else with us, um, either in person or virtually, wish to make a comment? Uh, yes, go ahead. Hi, um, sorry, it's Brad Watson using his wife, uh, Wendy Watson's uh, Zoom. Um, I want to um, uh, echo what Peter just said, but also uh, we had a, uh, a former town meeting like uh, uh, Zoom meeting about this whole um, hub and how to use the, the, uh, the, the country club uh, property. Um, I have lived in Montpelier since 1997. Um, I echoed 
during that meeting that there's been one thing uh, built in Montpelier for our kids and young families uh, since 1997, and that's the Civic Center, the Center for Montmor Memorial Civic Center. There's really been not a lot of other resources uh, provided to young families and our kids when it comes to having facilities that um, could bring families together. Um, I think we are at a critical uh, juncture in our beautiful small little town. And I'm, you see the gray hair on my head, but if you sit on the main street of Montpelier or State Street and look at our demographic, we are all gray. And if we wanna continue to try to attract young families to our town, vibrant and continue to the vibrancy that um, we've started, and I'll mention my mountain bike group, the Montpelier Area Mountain Bike Association with the new North Branch Park. But North Branch Park is actually changing a little bit slowly the demographics of Montpelier. And I think the hub and what they wanna do at um, the Old Elks Club will continue that. We'll start to see young families, their bikes on the car, tennis rackets, whatever. But I really implore the city council to think uh, forward, be forward-minded and proactive in trying to make our community more uh, attractive to young families. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else with us virtually wish to make a comment? Mayor Watson. Oh, yes. If I, could just, I just wanted to just respond one thing on, um, on uh, what Cameron had mentioned earlier, just to clarify our intentions for the exterior space. It's, there's very little that would be a permanent unmovable fixture. Uh, we basically want access so we could put out yard games, maybe a tent. Well, if there's a, a catered event up there, uh, if we have a restaurant tenant that's, that moves in, uh, that they could host an event on the, on the property uh, under their lease agreement. Um, a playground is a possibility, but certainly is something that would require, you know, some, some thought of how that gets done and, and where it would go. Um, but I also just, you know, in response to some of the, the grander visioning that discussions that have going on, I mean, this, this, what we're really asking for is a very, very small step towards that process. We know that that process is, we're at the beginning of a planning process. Uh, we are looking for the ability to negotiate an MOU. That's it. We're not looking for a commitment to build a racket sports barn at this point or any soccer fields or I don't know, biathlon range. That'd be fun, right? Yeah, Ethan? that would be cool. Be awesome. <laughs> but that's that's something for the future. And that's, um, you know, we're, we're really excited about hopefully being a part of that discussion. Great. Uh, Donna. So when Feast was talking about using freezer space, would you find that compatible? It, it's really, uh, I think it could be. I mean, I know that the, the Feast and the, the Meals on Wheels program, um, you know, they have certainly some needs. If there was a restaurant tenant, uh, depending on how they would use it, it, you know, it could be just for overflow or catering prep or, um, you know, a prep kitchen for their, for their downtown establishment. I, we don't really know. We expect that there would be service provided, you know, bar and, and, and food provided at the, at the building. So there would be some need for, con you know, continued use of the kitchen, but Who's to say what that looks like? I, I, again, it's something that we would need to right, talk over right. with the, the folks. With. We, we but, certainly work. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I do want to um, just mention too, I mean, I, I think it's perfectly fair to uh, speak generally about uh, these things, but I um, want to recognize that we're probably, we're not negotiating by committee here. Um, uh, so, so really the question is like, do we want to um, move forward with an, an MOU and let uh, and authorize uh, staff to, to do that negotiating um, or don't we? Um, that's, I think that's the, the question. So, um, but, but fair nonetheless, because that is, that's, I think that's a good question about, I mean, you know, are there, was, it was in the memo yes, the yes. Office could be a conflict or it could right. be workable. Right, right. And then I think that's that's fair, right? Like, yeah. um, are there other anticipated conflicts between these uses? Um, right. And I guess maybe I'll, I'll put that to you all. Do you, do you see any other spaces where there might be a conflict of use? 
I think the, the child care issue is one that we have been very supportive of. In fact, we've received a grant to, um, to, to build a child care facility in the space that we want to lease. So that's very compatible with that idea. Um, but anything that the city might think of doing, we're collaborators. We're not, we're not dictating anything here. Okay. Um, other thoughts from council? Connor, go ahead. And then Jack. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I remain comfortable with a short term MOU that the city negotiate that. Uh, for me, you know, like it's it's going to be a long process, three years. You know, I'd like to see revenue coming in. I'd like to make sure that space is full and not vacant for a period of time. And uh, if it's not going to be vacant, I'd rather have a tenant uh, like the hub who get, gets, you know, the community getting up to the space there, gets sort of the creative juices flowing, uh, creates some opportunities for kids, you know, who I think have had, had a rough go of it during the pandemic. Um, and gives the hub, I think, a, a chance to sort of prove their long-term viability over these next few years. Um, so I, I, I definitely understand the public perception. Um, I'd be adamant I want to see a public process just as much as everybody. And, uh, you know, but I, I, I think these ideas can be compatible. And I, I, I think these folks do bring a lot to the table. So I'd be comfortable with the short-term lease. Uh, Jack. Thank you. Um, I've actually gotten a lot of uh, input from constituents over the last day or two, and it's been pretty universally uh, positive. You know, it's no secret that I've been uh, kind of uh, skeptical about this whole plan, and, and my skepticism has largely been questioning whether this, the hub and the whole plan is... Uh, is really a feasible uh, feasible project, and you know one of the things that uh, has been pointed out to me is that back in November we said to the hub, well, you know, where's your where's your business plan? I don't think I still don't think we've seen a business plan, um, but uh, I think where we are is that the, the city owns an asset that could be generating some income and doing a lease for a short term and in the neighborhood of three years is an opportunity for the pub for, for the hub to uh, make a, a proof of concept and show that this is something that uh, will really work for the community um of the three things that uh, the hub is asking us to do uh one lease the building uh on a short-term basis to give them some kind of uh preferential status in the long-term st planning process and three make something that's uh less than a commitment but uh some kind of intention to reserve some of the real estate for them. The only one that I would really support is, is the first one, uh, lease the building for, for a three-year period, uh, generate some income for the city, uh, possibly hope potentially provide a resource that'll, that will be attractive to the, uh, to the city and, uh, and see how it goes, but I think it's uh, it would not short circuit or uh, interfere with the planning process, um, which I think is paramount. But but I would be in favor of having this uh, having the manager enter into a, into negotiations for a contract to lease the building uh, to the hub. Other thoughts, Donna, go ahead. I, mean, I guess just from the very beginning, I was excited to think about something really happening in the building that we have some rentals, but we need more and that would be activity. I've heard recently, actually I had two interns helping my electrician who just graduated from the tech school uh, last year. 
And they were talking about as 18 year olds, one was 18, one was 19, they couldn't drink, but they had no place to go socially. And they were interested and asked me, asked me, are, what were you going to do with that building? Are you going to let somebody come in? They didn't recognize your name, but they knew there was some discussion. And I thought, you know, um, I know we're talking three penny, but maybe within that, there can be a space up there within the building that, that or a time of day or certain times of the, of the month where youngsters, uh, young adults can go and be social and have some music and gathering without the alcohol. Uh, and that's a good thing too, uh, because there are probably many more people who would like to do that. So I'm, I really like the short-term lease idea. And you know we have stakeholders that are from organizations and I don't see having the hub there it, it, as any different if other people participating among the public. Uh, I'm hoping we'll get some other private developers who want to join and be there. And maybe they're there as residents, but they'll also be talking for the organization they're from because we need private developers at the table when we're planning in order to do housing and in order to do more uh, than our public dollars can do. And I'm not shy with saying my intention would be if you do well with the lease, we're going to move forward with some land and, and not committing where, just somewhere up there, we want to give some additional space for some recreational opportunities that the city can't afford to do. So I'm comfortable with moving forward, definitely with the short term, but even with the rest. Okay. Uh, Lauren and then Carrie. Okay. Yeah, I. I also like the um, idea of the short-term lease. I think um, getting some activity going, you know, all the reasons people have laid out. I think the lessons learned, even thinking back to the public hearing um, a few months ago, people were asking about like transportation, for example, like how are we gonna set up a system that can help people get out there besides just um, driving out? So I think those kinds of things we could be thinking through and using this time, if there's activities there that's drawing people to, Kind of troubleshoot some of the other issues and you know hopefully get people used to going to that <laughs> to that part of town um I, I think one thing i one way i was thinking about the longer term um idea was something like an intent to um have the hub as part of the recreation stakeholder process putting forward you know for like environmental impact statements, often there's like an option A, option B, option C, like that they would be, you know, part of the process putting forward um, proposals alongside the city for the community to consider so that, you know, that we want that kind of robust conversation and consideration and that the community could look at the kind of the package of options and, you know, being able to do that work collaboratively, which is what I'm hearing um, that the, um, the folks from the hub are interested in that you know, that could actually give us better information if it's just kind of explicitly the, um, the intention and hope of us to be getting that kind of information throughout the process of what's the, what's the vision of the hub, how does that complement what the city uh, would offer and all of that. So I don't know if that um, meets, you know, that idea would meet the, the hope of the hub um, or uh, address the concern of Jack or others, <laughs> um, but that was kind of how I was thinking the process could look. Yeah, I have a, a couple questions for you about your use of the space. Um, um, we heard some some suggestions from um, from Donna about things that might happen there, but I, you haven't described tonight what would happen there. Um, so my understanding is that you would want to sublet to Three Penny Tap Room for a restaurant and bar, which I, I'm assuming would be open to the public. Is that correct? Correct. And then you want to have virtual golf, which you've mentioned in the past. It's, it's more than virtual golf, but it's virtual uh, golf is the uh, most identifiable. Two other kinds Just of swing. swing them. The, it's a, it, the uh, virtual golf is it's vir really virtual sports. Okay. Uh, it's, it has different attributes. And would that be open to the public? For a, a use fee, yeah. But it would be it, 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 the, the the structure for payment of of the use of the space would be either through a membership or or a, a use fee, or if you wanted to rent the our our get our uh, social um room that we were looking into a social lounge that we're intending to to develop in one of the spaces um 
that it, there would be a fee associated with it. So Sim if you wanted to come to and, and spend some time socializing in a place without alcohol in your social lounge, you would pay well, there, an entry there'd be, fee? There'd be classes, there'd be other things provided, dancing and you know, dance classes or whatnot. There, so there would it's similar in, uh, you can imagine what, what happens at uh, the current rec, rec center on Berry Street, like that place and you pay to pay to participate and use that space. It's not free to, to anybody to go in and use. So even now it's there's a rental agreement mm -hmm. with users going in there or you're paying a few bucks to play basketball at lunch. It's still it's of the same drop in fee kind of structure or you're paying a membership. Are you asking whether it would be accessible to anyone who wanted to come in? Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, members would be paying a monthly fee and they can come in and participate in the activities. And if they choose not to be a member, they can get a date and come in for the day. Or if there's a particular event they want to participate in, they can come in and participate. If there's a fee for that event, they may pay more than a member would, but they would still be able to come in. And there's a possibility of working with the city about um, you know, providing day passes for the city to uh, use through their rec department. So if there are certain events where uh, the city wants to have residents who are not members have a day pass, they can buy them from the city. Right. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the answers. Um, so I really share um, uh, Cameron's um, view about trying to limit any kind of permanent changes or, or any kind of use to the space, the, the buildings or the property that would be permanent or hard to undo. And so I love the idea of soccer up there. I love the idea of equipment storage and things like that that are really not committing us to anything. And um, so my concern about the short-term lease is that even though it would technically be for three years and would technically be written um, without an assumption that there would be a renewal, the expectation certainly will, and the hope will be that it would be renewed and this would be the, the first step of a much larger project. And I think that's really clear from you all, are, the hub is intending to do that. And I think that the counselors who have spoken um, sound like they're, and I don't want to speak for you, but my, what I'm getting from you is that you're, you're, you're seeing this possible future and this being a step towards it. And, and I think, so I'm really committed to the public process. And I, um, I did come into this a little bit later than the other people on the city council. So I didn't hear your November presentation, haven't been part of these discussions. And, um, and it, it feels, uh, early for me to be able to even have a, express an intention that I want to see this happen. Um, and I think that having a short-term lease would be a way for the city to be saying, we intend to work with you in the future. And that is also part of what you're, you're asking for. I recognize that. So I am not feeling comfortable that this would not get in the way of the public planning process. Um, I think that there, the public perception would be that the city has entered into a long-term agreement with the hub. And uh, that I know is not necessarily, that's not the case, but I think that would be the public perception. And, um, and I think we have a lot of work to do before we are ready to make that long-term commitment. But to be clear, we're, we're, we're not asking for that long-term commitment and as it's our our duty and yours to help break that misconception. You know, you 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 have heard us say we're not looking for a long term lease. We're not looking for a long term commitment, but we do have an intent to be a, a stakeholder for the development of this property. That is our intention, and we're not going to change that. I mean, it's, it is our intention. <laughs> so I you know I guess I would put it back to you as as a a, a public official. When you're talking with your constituents and, and hearing from them that those sorts of misconceptions you can tell them that is actually not true you can good um i think we need to be i think it's a little disingenuous to say that it's not true that this would be a step towards a long-term commitment and relationship with the hub 
And, and uh, you know, that's, that's how it seems. That I, I think that's why we're, we're talking about this and why we're not talking about directly leasing to three penny, for instance. If what, if what the city wants is a restaurant up there, we could lease to three penny ourselves or to some other restaurant. Um, but the reason why we're talking about doing it with the hub is because there have been these previous conversations because there is this idea that we may work with them long term. And, and that may be the way that we want to go. Um, I would just prefer to have that decision come out of this public planning process that we're going to embark on, even though I recognize that it would slow it down enormously and that there is great value to having activity happening up there and having something going on. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jennifer, I apologize. Well, you're so, fine. I'm just over here in the corner. Don't mind me. <laughs> um, I, I, I am going to be the stick in the mud here and I'm with Carrie on this. I just don't feel very, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel right to me um because of the fact that there still isn't much of a plan it's the i i i it just feels like a, a small presentation for something that is potentially really huge and and i'm not so comfortable um rushing into something and i feel like i'm being pushed into something and i've felt this way the entire time and i don't know if having virtual gaming up there right now is what everybody wants. I think we need to really think about what the public wants. And like Peter said earlier, you know, we housing is a huge thing. I feel like housing is a bigger pressing issue in Montpelier than recreation. I'm sorry. I, I'm going to be that person because we live in a beautiful state and there's plenty of places to go and I don't have a yard and I find plenty of places to take my children for free. And um, so I just, I feel like I'm being pushed into something, rushed into something. And I just, I would rather take time and have business plans and financials and all those things in place before we commit to three years with an organization. Have we talked to other organizations that might want to, you know, develop or use those buildings? I don't know. We haven't gone there. So I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not with it yet. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, other other thoughts? Any other th I think um, before we get yeah. to you, Ethan, any other thoughts council would like to share? Yeah, Lauren, go ahead. I guess I'm thinking about, like, I, I totally understand the perception issue because like, I do not feel like we're making any long-term And so like, I don't agree with that. I think I'm kind of with like, if anyone said that, I'd be like, no, we're doing a short-term lease. And I think right now to me, if we you know, decide to move forward, it would be authorizing community staff to see if there's something that is very clearly a short-term lease that is not authorizing any kind of infrastructure or anything that's locking in, which is my understanding of what the proposal is, is that this is really just getting some activity going. Okay. Okay. Yes, I think. Okay. Shut up. I get it. Wait here a second. Okay. Wow. That's remarkable. Is that better? Hendrix do that. Okay. Um. <laughs> I know. I wouldn't think this would be the, the most intense one of them. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I I guess I it, I also don't necessarily think we're locking in anything tonight if we're talking about kind of authorizing a negotiation that we would be approving later, right? Like we're not just saying go forth and do any kind of uh, negotiation and just move forward without us seeing if it actually is meeting the um, intentions of 
you know, what council, and maybe that's a misunderstanding. <laughs> well, so that's uh, an interesting question. Uh, if we, right, well, if, so if we do go forward with um, some kind of negotiated um, agreement for a short-term lease, uh, I mean, most city properties that get leased, we don't approve, right? Like we don't, oh, do we? Oh, <laughs> really? That... Even like short-term, well, okay. All right, well, yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like if someone rented space in the city, oh, okay. you know what I mean? Like there's, yeah, they, you, so right, like I, those I kinds say, of things. So things like it, a lease for a day, you've approved the fees, like for a day fee, right. or as part of the fee schedule at the senior center, those kind of things. But for a, I mean, we don't have that many cases where we've long-term right. leased a, the use of a, okay. I mean, my, my general assumption would have been we'd negotiate getting it. Come back for your mm -hmm. okay, but no, no, that's fair. That no, that's that, okay. You vote, that's, you vote how you vote. That's that's fair. Okay, I just wanted to clarify you that. Like all the power. <laughs> uh, Donna, we have other renters in there. Are you coming to us? Before well, so you we inherited those rent those leases, and and what so we we said mm -hmm. we, we told them we would honor those leases, we didn't think we should be booting people out, and what as we were having a public process, it was before we were really talking about this and it was bringing some revenue in because we we now have expenses yeah you know that we didn't have before so um it made sense to do that um presum presumably when we came time to make decisions about either extending them or terminating them uh, we would come to the council just if nothing else so you know what's going on do you, um, do you remember are they one year two year what they're, they're different they're all have different we have we do have an inventory i just don't remember yeah okay Thank you, uh, Lori. Here, what about, um, I, I mean, I'm thinking of Jennifer's thought and um, kind of picking up a little of Carrie's hesitation, but, you know, putting out an RFP and seeing interest in renting it, the hub would apply, and then if there's other interest, and then it's a more community process and there's opportunity to see, you know, are there I, I have nobody else has come forward that I've heard of that is interested. So that's part of why it's like, well, if nobody else wants it and somebody's <laughs> putting forward like a proposal, great, let's use the space. But um, I know that that certainly slows the timeline down, but um, just an idea. Yeah. yeah, that is scary. That is a very interesting idea. Um, I yeah, I would, I would love to consider that. Uh, I think that that would I think the reason why uh, no one else has come forward is because it hasn't occurred to other people that it might be a reasonable, a possible thing to do. If we put out an RFP, then it would be communicating that we're interested in short-term use of this space while we go through this public planning process. Jack. I was ex thinking the exact same thing Lauren was at the same time. I think that that's, uh, I, I, I think it, this is a potentially beneficial thing, but I also don't want to be in the uh, in the place of uh, overriding uh, some very valid concerns that uh, Jen and Carrie have, and, and so I think uh, doing an RFP for the for the use of the of the building is uh, is a good way to proceed. Other thoughts? Any thoughts on that? No, I, I wanted to respond to, is this on? Sorry. Uh, yes. I wanted to respond to um, Carrie's earlier question about what activities we were planning to have up there. So in addition to the restaurant and bar, which would be open to the public, but separated from the rest of the space so that young people would not be wandering in and out of a bar, uh, we would be having a game rooms for uh, for uh, youth activities and game rooms for, uh, you know, might have things like bridge night or chess night or card night or competitions, uh, both uh, inside and outside, but uh, nothing that would be a permanent uh, structure in there. There would also be a meeting room and a lounge. So uh, the... Uh, 
the, it would be a whole range of regular recreational and social activities going on on a fairly constant basis, particularly during times when families uh, are sitting around trying to figure out what to do because they, they each of their family members may have something different they want to do. They can go there and each of them can find the activity they're interested in. Jack. I can tell you that uh, while they were in high school, one of my sons and his friends were regulars at the pool table at McGillicuddy's and they were, whether they were supposed to be there or not because it's a bar, I don't know, but I know that they were there. And so it was, uh, <clears throat> that's the kind of thing that draws people. All right, I'm gonna make a motion. Uh, okay. I move that we direct uh, the city staff to issue uh, requests for proposals um, to be prepared or to come to us at our next meeting with the draft RFP uh, for a very, fairly short timeline because, uh, you know, like 60 days uh, <clears throat> and uh, and see what, what other uh, interest there is in use of the building before we make a decision. So I'm clear on the motion, you want us to draft our features to have you review and approve before it goes out. Okay. That was what I was thinking, Just yeah. So we you wouldn't issue it before the next meeting. We would issue it at the next meeting. Yeah, do you do you think that's reasonable, Bill? Or do you I think just it's- want to know what you were saying. Now, yeah, do you think it would be- Because if you if you would ask, authorize us to issue one, I was then gonna ask, do you want us, are there specific activities that we could have higher preference for? So mm -hmm. in some regards, this might be, we can take a crack at it. You can then weigh it as you see fit. It, it seems like the way we usually work with RFPs is that we get a draft from you and then usually approve it without any changes, but, <laughs> but still. So I just wanna check in with you all about this idea, the timeline. Etc. This does not meet our timeline. Oh, is there a second? Second. Okay, Lauren. I guess I, I mean part of. Ooh, I'm very loud. Sorry. Um, I mean, I, I guess I, I'm thinking. I don't know how different responding to an RFP versus like the plan that you would be ideally putting to the city, how different that would be. And presumably that would take a while to negotiate anyway, but so I, but I, I get that it slows things down. Yeah. Yep. Um, Donna, then Carrie. Well, two things I wanna, to an RFP, you have to decide what you need. And we have, wanted them to stay everybody to stay flexible and yet we're part of the time we're asking for a business plan but we want them to stay flexible and so it's a chicken and the egg in that we want a partner who's going to work to supplement and increase what's available both on the social and on the sports and so it does take sitting down in the negotiation and the city saying we feel strongly about this and da, 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 and you work it out I don't see anywhere that the city has rented a space and done an RFP. I feel like we've pushed this off and pushed this off. And I feel that a short-term lease is not bypassing anything with public input for the long-term planning. It'll be four years before we start digging folks. And three-year lease to me is totally reasonable. I, I, I totally respect the public process and it'll be there. It'll be happening while we're meanwhile, we have and I think one of the things of them mentioning Three Penny and getting them is a place that we feel that we've seen its behavior in town and we've seen its success like Bar Hill. And so to me, that's like, oh, that's a good source to have out there. And again, everything that's come back, I mean, they've made list of games here that in their memos, of lots of detail. So if you go back and read their memos that they've given us, there's lots of possibilities there but they also want to stay fluid to what we want. So I feel we're expecting too much concrete from them because on the other hand, we don't want anything concrete. So I will not support an RFP. Connor. 
I don't really like oppose the RFP idea, but I'm also cognizant. You know, we tabled this like a month ago when you were pretty clear with us that you're on a timeline. Uh, so it feels like maybe changing the rules of the game as we go along here. Could you talk a little bit more about your timeline and what if an RFP were issued like next week or something and we didn't have to approve it? The next council meeting, but we gave staff a discretion to sort of form that with some input from us. Do you mind just like talking about the timeline now, please? Uh, well, the timeline is we would like to have a three year lease. That's basically what we're asking for. Uh, and we want to be involved in the recreation part of it. Um, we have been ready to go for quite some time, even before the city bought the property. We were ready to go in December of last year. And so we have loans lined up, we have a grant lined up. Uh, we have to use the grant this year if we don't for child care if we don't use the grant this year we lose it it's a three-year grant um we need to get three penny is not interested in waiting any longer they need to be in before christmas um we uh all of our fundraising we, that we started we had to put on hold because this the, the situation has been put on a pause uh it just you know and and the issues of the um, uh, getting these uh, virtual game equipment in there. All of these are removable things. They're not things that, and, and even when Three Penny goes in, they're bringing their own equipment in. This is not going to be something that is going to be permanent equipment. If, if at the end of the lease decisions made, you know, the hub isn't going to be in there anymore, they can move all their equipment out. Um, they, they need to get in there by Christmas and they need a place that they need to go. If they can't get in there by Christmas, we may not, I mean, I don't know, uh, they, they would have to make that decision, but they've made it fairly clear to us, very clear to us that they need to be in there by November 1st. Um, Carrie, um, I had a question for Bill. How, what's the fastest turnaround from tonight that we could um, do the RFP process. Um, if we had some, and I'm going to count on Mike and or Cameron to interrupt me if I get this wrong. Um, I think the, the biggest struggle with the biggest challenge with any RFP, and I will answer your question, but I guess is knowing what you're asking for. So we could ask for just highest bidder, you know, who, who wants to make proposals to use this space and how much well, you pay for it, we could say we want proposals that include a recreation component and a child care component. We could say, make us a proposal that shares space with this, you know. So, so a lot of it depends on what we're asking for and that will change the market for who's interested is what, what we put into it. So if there was clarity about what we wanted to ask for, we could probably get an RFP out pretty quickly. I think our RFP writers are all three of them are in the room. Josh, Mike, and Cameron. So, um, you know, again, but you know, you want to give. So, could, but we we also have three weeks till the next meeting, not two. So maybe we could have responses. Maybe they come in right before the meeting. Uh, you know, I maybe. Do you mean? You, I mean, if you want to know the absolute quickest, but that would be that would not give people much time to respond, and it would not. You know, it would mean we have to lightning get one out the door, right? I mean. It, and please tell me I'm wrong here. I'm making <laughs> so you get to Friday, right? Yeah. So I mean that's but I mean those are all you know you gotta you gotta post it, you've got you gotta define what you're asking for, what the terms of submission are, like what we're looking for. And then we've got to, you know, presumably some people would want to tour the space. I mean that we could manage. Um give a period of time for people to prepare. I think these folks, you know, know what they want. So they'd be able to prepare something, but somebody who never thought of it before needs to at least think about what they want. And then, um, and then some process for evaluating whether it's just we hand them to the council and you all decide, or we have a score sheet that we, you know, give them to you or whatever. But so it all, a lot depends on the clarity going forward. Yeah, go ahead. I also wanted to sort of put on the table just another, an RFP is not the only option that you have. There's other 
processes that we could go through. There's a request for information, which is more of just give us your proposal, which I think would be more similar to what the hub has done, is uh, less formal, um, gives folks the opportunity to say, if I had this space, this is what I would do with that space that it doesn't have to be as formal as an RFP process. It could be a council is interested to hear what else is out there. If people wanted to bring something to this space, an RFI would be a much quicker and simpler process. Okay, thank you. That was gonna be my, my next question. Um, Cause I, I agree that an RFP for a lease is an odd thing that I haven't seen before and um, but I would like some way to kind of communicate to the public that it's possible that we might be able to lease this space out um, for something and tell us your ideas and come to us with your thoughts. And so if an RFI would be the way to do that. And so then my next question would be, could we authorize the staff to do that tonight, keeping it really open so we don't have, we're not asking for certain kinds of uses. We're just saying, tell us what you, what you have and then come back in three weeks and That's bring to us what you've got. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, Ethan, go ahead. So I, I have a question about this and in, in, um, how would doing this as a RFP or an RFI uh, mitigate your concerns about um, offering a, th a three-year lease to anybody without the public process having taken place. I don't, I don't understand. It sounds more like you're just saying, I wanna get somebody in there and get some money from them, but, um, and I, the public process doesn't matter as much if it's, if it's done with an RFI. I don't, that doesn't really add up for me. Uh, Jack, go ahead. I have a response to that. And my response is that I don't think that that, it is really a fair criticism because what I'm hearing at least two members of the council say is that they don't want the perception that uh, someone came to the council before we got took even step one of our public process and lined up this deal to rent the property and nobody else even had the chance to uh, to come in and say that they they wanted to do it and maybe someone else would have uh, had a better idea than you and maybe someone else would have offered more money than you are and uh, and there's a perception and so and so that's what my thinking is yeah, and, and i, I don't no, and, I, I understand and i don't think the term i'm not married to the terminology rfp i'd be happy to uh go with carrie's proposal to say well let's let's be in a position to put out whatever requests we need to put out so we, we're in a position to make a decision at our next meeting. So do we think it would be realistic to put out an RFI? You have enough information you feel to put out an RFI and to get responses by the next meeting? Yeah, because we could structure it loosely and we could obviously ask, you know, I mean, this, there might be a lot of interest, but some may, you know, I think we could say, provide your estimate of, you know, would this be a revenue generating, we, we, you know, because there's probably people, oh, I could have a this, that there, and the city could let me have it for free. So I think, you know, we would be saying, no, the city is looking to lease with, you know, so for financial terms. So what is it you're proposing? And at least I don't think we need a business plan. Um, and by the way, just for the record, we did get confidentially a look at their business, but so they have provided one to staff. We didn't keep it because we want to a create a public record, but they did show it to us. So they have shared that oh, with us, just so you know. There, uh, there was a business, there was a document that I was meeting with and they, them and they sh offered to show it to me. And I said, well, you know, you give it to me, it's a public record. So do you want to do that? And, and they wisely decided not to give yeah. it to me. And so, so we went over the, the things, but we never got a copy of any records. Um, so I just wanted that to be clear that to the extent that anyone says they haven't provided something they said they would, they did. And I'm not shilling for them or against them, just that's a fact. Um, so I think we would ask for, you know, your idea, how it would be used, um, how it would generate revenue for use, you know, to pay the lease. And, uh, you know, I think personally, I would say it ought to be something, it ought to be in the public's interest 
or open to the public. I don't know hey, what you all think about that. Not just, you know, we're going to create a private, I'm going to use it, you know, for a warehouse and pay you top dollar because it's a big space that I could, you know, I think, cause I, I guess as I'm thinking about this out loud, one of the goals of what we're talking about is to get people going up there and using the space. So I think a criteria would be something that will generate a public use, but also generate an income. And it wouldn't have to be, you know, long drawn out. It'd just be, here's kind of, you know, here's our overview of what we would propose to do and what it might look like. And then you could pick the one that you thought was most attractive and be where we are, authorize us to negotiate a lease with them. I mean, if that's what you wanted to do. David, would you feel, would you want me to amend my motion in order to say that, or are you happy with, with that given the gloss? I think you, you ought to be clear. Our RFP is a term of art. Okay. And I think it would be clear to just what you're doing and that you, because that you, you want to move this quickly. Um, I mean, obviously we have this conversation. I've heard it, we've all heard it, but it's still for the record. Okay, so I move to amend my motion to uh, direct the city manager to issue an RFI for uses of the real estate for a three-year lease um, with the, as the manager said, uh, uh, a component of uh, public activity uh, on the property and um, with the responses to be ready to be acted on at our next meeting. Is there anything else you'd need? No, we'll make up the rest. Okay, yeah. So that was a motion to amend my motion. Second. Okay, further discussion about that. Yes, Donna. Could you make it due so that it's gonna be in the packet on the 10th? Yeah. Okay. I, I, yes, yeah, so that it, so you would have them to review in advance of the meeting. Yes. I'm glad you changed it to an RFI, but I'm going to vote against it because I don't think that leasing something for three years requires. Okay. Um, further discussion about this. Um, Peter Kelman, go ahead. Yep, you're good now. Uh, I'm feeling free to speak a second time because this is a different motion than the or than the discussion before. That's why I called on you. Thank you. Um, I don't think this is a good idea, this RFI. Let me just say very clearly, and by the way, all of you know that I am in favor of public engagement as much as anybody on the city council. I don't feel that having an RFI to have somebody else come forward is going to change the misperceptions that are possible in any way. I don't think it addresses the legitimate concern that Jennifer and Carrie have raised. But I think that the concern that Jennifer and Carrie have raised is one that we all, all of us, need to be able to talk to people who have concerns about this. This, this is a unique group. They've been thinking about this for a long time. They have lots of plans. They've, they, they've demonstrated flexibility. They've come back with a proposal that was is much less uh, grand uh, than, than the first one. And to, to, do, to, to delay it further, where they are probably in danger of losing their loan, all of these delays, this kicking the can down the road, I don't think anything will be gained by it. And I think what would be more important would be to enter into a, a short-term, uh, negotiation for a short-term uh, arrangement. And I think that, that, that Bill now knows what the concerns are. And part of this is to announce this in a way that will be uh, understandable by the public. Uh, anyway, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'd be very disappointed if you kick this down the, the can down the road. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stan, go ahead. Hi, Stan Brinkerhoff from, from District 2. 
Um, you know, when this when this issue came up, uh, when when we all voted on it, I, I think there's a lot of discussion on front page forum and other places around, you know, what the plan was. And I, I think for a lot of us, the hub was part of that plan. Getting folks up there was part of the plan. Using it as a recreational space was part of the plan. Um, I, I haven't personally been up there. I, I don't know if it's open to the public. I, I think it is. But um, having a group like the hub enter into that short-term agreement, I think, I, I believe was pretty well understood. I, I thought that was part of the deal. I thought that was, um, you know, what that use of that building was intended for until we had a larger plan for it, including things like housing. Um, if if the hub can't make use of it and you know, the timing doesn't work for them, having a building sit for three years is is not ideal. Um, you know, for for folks who represent me in District Two, I would I would really appreciate uh, a thought to help support what I believe we, we were voting for at the time. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Nat Winthrop. Go ahead. Hi. Um... I'm vice chair of the hub. I, I made part of the presentation at the last meeting. Um, as I reported then, uh, we've been in discussions with the Vermont Community Loan Fund. The folks there are very excited about this project. Um, it, it would represent the biggest project that they've ever uh, given a loan for uh, in their history, and they're based in Montpelier. And as has already been said, we've been working on this for more than a year. Just about a year ago, it was the city that proposed a public-private partnership. Um, we've been talking to the city uh, regularly ever since for, uh, going on a full year, going on 12 months. Um, this is well thought out. We have shared a business plan and a financial plan with uh, Josh Jerome, who's our point person in the administration. So it's simply not accurate that uh, we don't have a business plan or we haven't shared it. We just did not want to make it public because we keep having to tweak it. We keep having to shift it as circumstances change. Um, you know, the, the bond uh, specifically referenced recreation. No one else has come forward since the bond was passed. That's several months ago. Um, and there is the possibility that we uh, our plan may not turn out to be viable if we have to wait another month or two. And I think having three penny who have consistently said that they're enthusiastic, um, they said we could go public with their uh, intentions to run a restaurant and bar up there. Um, so uh, I think a bird in the hand namely the hub for three years, uh, who, who is prepared to invest millions of dollars uh, in the longer term should, uh, should a path be made clear through the planning process for us to participate uh, after the first three years. Um, all of that uh, is something that you shouldn't take lightly or casually, you know, we're ready to step up to the plate. We're ready to start construction uh, in terms of renovating the space um, as of October 1st, um, mainly for uh, three penny, but also for this virtual sports equipment. Um, there are already three tenants in there, so we would be a fourth tenant. Uh, I just think uh, to go, you know, you already uh, tabled us at uh, five weeks ago. Um, 
now it would be for at least another three weeks and probably uh, for substantially longer than that. And at a certain point, it's just not going to work for us. So I'd really appeal to you folks um, to authorize the city to negotiate this short-term lease. I think it's very much in the public interest. Thank you. Um, I want to just be clear that the motion that we're voting on right now is about the language change to an RFI. Um, I have thoughts that I want to share about that as well, about you know the, the this plan in general. Um, but thoughts on any any further thoughts on just changing the language from RFP to an RFI? Yes. Well, I, you know, I uh, totally get the sentiment. Um, I think just at the end of the day, you know, three more weeks isn't gonna, you know, I don't think anybody's coming up with a viable offer that's gonna knock everybody's socks out. So to me, it feels sort of like the illusion of public input, you know, on such a short timeline. I agree with the idea of an RFP. I just think it would, would have had to have been done months ago to really get some, you know, serious bids in there. Um, so I, I think I still am where I was. I, I think there's value to this. Um, it brings in revenue, and uh, I think it would be a service to the community. So I'll I'll be voting against it as well. Um, okay. So, but to be clear, yes, Lauren. Okay. So, so as the person who brought forward this idea, I, I mean, I've heard a couple of things since I had offered that thought as a way to move forward, including some details on the timeline before it had just been more amorphous to me. Like, of course you wanna move as quickly as possible, but some of these grants and things that are lined up and especially the childcare to me, like getting that in, it's part of our strategic plan. If you know that I didn't, you know, some of those details and apologies cause I missed the last meeting. So I'm sure some of that might've been talked about. So um, my apologies that I'm, I think catching up a little with some of the details. I mean, to me also, you know, a fourth tenant in a building for a short-term lease. You know, it, I, I'm more prepared to move forward now hearing this. And, you know, maybe as part of the announcement, it's we're also talking about the public process for the long-term and broader, you know, like everyone get your ideas. Like, let's really, you know, get together as a community and think about what we want to use the space for, which has so many opportunities for recreation and housing and, other things. So, you know, I think hopefully we can be thoughtful in how that's put out and really clear. This is a short term lease opportunity to use the space as we figure out the long term vision for the place. So I will uh, be voting against, or I guess I would vote for the motion to make it an RFI, but I'm going to vote against doing an RFI. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, any further thoughts just about RFP versus RFI? Okay. Anything you would like to say about that? RFP versus RFI? I don't think either the RFI or the RFP would meet our timetable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair enough. Um, all right. <laughs> so, uh, further comments on this amendment to uh, the original motion? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, oh, sorry. So we are voting Get, on an on, amendment to the motion, but not ultimately the motion. Right, so this is, uh, <laughs> okay. So, right, we're voting on, should we change the language to an RFI versus the original language, which is an RFP? Okay, further discussion. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Aye. And, Jennifer, I'm not sure I heard you. Because I didn't vote. Okay. Would you like to vote one way or the other? Nope. Okay. Um, we, I think we have to do roll, roll call. Uh, that's okay. Lauren. Aye. Jack. Aye. Connor. Aye. Carrie. Aye. Donna. Aye. And Jennifer. Not. Uh, you're abstaining. I don't, I can't, I can't vote either way. Okay. Okie dokie. Um, all right, so now we, oh gosh, 
math. Okay, so that motion passes. Um, so now we are on to, should we issue an RFI uh, for this um, at this point? So I think we're clear on what the motion is. Should we issue an RFI for the use of the space? Um, probably. Should we just start with that? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go around. I'm gonna end with Jennifer. Okay, Lauren. Nay. Jack. Aye. Connor. Nay. Harry. Aye. Donna. Nay. And Jennifer. Nay. Sorry. What was that? Aye. N that was nay. No, I. Oh, I. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> so it's three three. Okay, um, I am going to vote nay, and so there we are. Um, so the motion does not pass. Um, Jack, I move we authorize the city manager to enter into a three year uh, lease with the hub. I second it. Um, nope. I feel like we should. Uh, is does that work for you? Because I feel like it could be like to authorize to negotiate a yeah. three-year lease. Is negotiate that negotiate and then enter into to the council? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. And there and that's also I, your I, understanding. I okay. Remember that we're asking for a memorandum of understanding. It has three components, not just the three-year lease. That's not not those other components are not part of the motion. Okay. Okay. Um, further discussion on that part of it. Okay, not seeing any. Which part, I'm sorry, Mayor. Um, okay, sorry, this is um, a motion about. To authorize the manager to negotiate a lease to come back to the council for review and approval or consideration. Okay. Um, any further comments from anybody about that? And yes, Jack. Jennifer, if you're just wanted clarification, oh. I was not proposing to include the special status in the planning process or the anticipated uh, commitment of land to the uh, to the hub in the future. That would all be. They, they have absolutely the same right as anyone else to participate in the public process, but not, and to advocate for whatever land they think they should have, but not a memorandum of understanding giving them anything at this point. Okay. Um, Jennifer, I saw that you had a hand up. Do you have anything? Yeah, I just... I just wanted to be clear about why I'm being resistant is because I don't really understand. I mean, I've, I've, I've emailed with them. I've seen their presentations and I still don't really understand what the hub it's like, I've been throwing all these different ideas, childcare, this, that, and the other. And it's like, how are you going to do all that in a small space? And then also have a bar with childcare. It just, it, it doesn't feel clear to me. And that is where, that is why I'm struggling with this because it, you guys have a lot of ideas, which I think are brilliant ideas, but they just seem very scattered. And I just don't feel comfortable with that. And that's the reason why it's nothing personal. It just feels very scattered to me. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, any further discussion about any of it? Okay, um, I think I'm gonna go just do a roll call. Um, and I'm gonna do the same order, ending with Jennifer. All right, uh, Lauren. Aye. Jack. Aye. Connor. Aye. Carrie. Nay. Donna. Aye. And Jennifer. Nay. Okay, so the motion passes. Uh, so we'll uh, be doing that. Any further discussion about any um, of the rest of the proposal? Okay, not seeing anything at this point. Um, okay. 
Um, sorry, is anybody else hearing that really high pitch? Yeah. That is very curious. Um, I thought you all would like to share at this point. Um, I would be, I would be curious uh, if one of the council members was willing to offer a, a motion to consider the other two uh, aspects that we're requesting be in a memorandum of understanding. Um, yeah, um, any thoughts about that team? Okay. Um, anything more you um, could tell us about those other two aspects? Well, uh, just to clarify, Jack earlier said that we were asking for a commitment for space. That is not what we're asking for. We're just asking for a statement that says uh, there's an intent to try to make a collaborative effort so that we can invest our three or four million dollars in this project on that property. Uh, but we're not asking for a commitment. We're just asking that something, there be some understanding between us and the city so that we, we know how to plan our future. Um, and second, that um, we, we do feel that we have uh, a, a legitimate request asking to have a stakeholder position in the discussions about the recreation, given that the history of the whole process that's mm -hmm. gone on, which most of the council members are familiar with. But um, just as a reminder, we were the ones that introduced the city to the idea that that property might be available. And we were about to sign a lease with the former owner uh, to allow us to go ahead with our project. So I, I don't feel like we're just coming from out of nowhere asking for uh, a slightly different uh, position rather than just the person when there's a public notice put out there's, there's going to be discussion about it um so you know we feel that that these are things that really we would like to have in writing so that we we can plan our future the lease is important and i'm really grateful that um that the the council has considered it but it doesn't put us in a very safe position if you understand um we, we really need to feel like we have a little bit more security and an understanding, a written understanding that, because one of the reasons we're in this position right now is because we have nothing in writing. Mm -hmm. And so we feel that it's really important that we have something in writing that gives us some sense of what we can do in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Donna. <clears throat> I've been in a lot of planning groups in my going on nine, nine years on the council and no one at the table has ever had a, a more stake. I mean, they're your stakeholder, you're a stakeholder. You have people come to the meetings, they talk, they share their opinion at some point. Indeed, if the vision is, Oh, we want to do this and you want to come and present something to the planning process, then you and others can do that. Uh, but I, uh, that's the one that maybe I think is a little strange. I think you just need to get your members to the planning meetings and, and have them vocalize it just the way everyone else does. And, and the intent, on one hand, I totally understand you needing something. And I, I would propose a motion, but I don't think it'll pass. <laughs> um, but I'm not sure how we can have a flexible intent. I mean, we can say we have an intention to do that, but it's not a promise, but yet, it, yet somehow it gives, how would you use it? So we give you this intent. How would you use that? Would you use it to go to the bank and say, this is a likelihood? Um, uh, well, I, I think um, we would use it in our, in our you know, hub planning processes of knowing that this is the intention that we're gonna move forward, that we don't need to be thinking about alternative places to, to put up our structure. We've got a three-year lease and we don't know what's going to happen next. And even if we don't have a commitment, but we know that that's the intent, if both parties can agree on it, and that can be worded in a memorandum of understanding in a way that everyone is comfortable with. Well, then I suggest you work on language within the MOU, and then it comes back to the council, and we'll see if you get the wording that people can accept. Uh, yeah. I don't think you'll get a motion specifically on it, but you could 
you could try to bring it back as one of the options how the MOU would read. Yes. The lease, the yeah, lease agreement. Well, that, keep in mind that what we're asking for is an MOU. And one of the components of the MOU is that we would negotiate a, a lease, which would be a separate document. There, the lease document is not the same as the MOU. They're two yeah. different documents. So the MOU would contain uh, things that would give us more confidence that we know how to move forward, that we have an expectation that um, it is everyone's intent to try to make this work. It doesn't mean we know that it will work, but it's everyone's intent that it's going to work. Well, I can see that possibly happening at the end of our first year of planning, mm -hmm. as things get more pictured and visualized, uh, but I, I'm, I can't I can't well, we put yeah. we could put that in the MOU that after yeah. the first year of the lease that we would have a discussion about what the long term plans are, but something that would give us some idea of you know where we're going to stand in in three years. Okay. The problem with that, I I recognize why you want that. The problem with that is that speaking as one council person. I don't have any idea where we're going to stand in three years, and uh, and I can't make a commitment that our intention is anything at this point, other than to get a lot of public input and get a lot of put a lot of uh, resources into planning, and then move forward on what looks like the bet like it would best serve the public interest after we have all of that. And that's really the only commitment that I can uh, that I can make. Um, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, I to me this really gets at the crux of the concern Carrie expressed of like feels like you're getting ahead of public process to say we have a predetermined outcome, we're going to go through motions, but we anticipate getting here. I mean. It, I don't know if this actually accomplishes what you're looking for, because I, you know, like Jack, I, I totally get why you, why you want this. And, um, you know, it's something like it's the hub's intention to demonstrate as part of this three year lease that we are a viable and vibrant part of the community and drawing people in, you know, so somehow maybe there's like some way to measure this is proving to be a successful, you know, um, public asset for the community and therefore you know that's giving you that information you can bring to the public process of look at you know it's kind of this is the proof of concept and let's see how it's working and so um, there might be a way to word it that way um, that I would be more comfortable with um, I think. Um, any other thoughts on this? So it sounds like um, there's not necessarily support for this at this point. Am I, am I incorrect? Am I, um, so, but let's uh, let's keep talking. Um, so thank you, um, and I look forward to uh, what you all come up with to potentially be approved at the next meeting. Um, any any further thoughts that folks have on any of this? Okay. Yeah. I'd just like to say thank you to all of you for taking the time to really think about this seriously because it it's a tough balance that you're trying to achieve here and you know obviously we have our needs and we're going to advocate for them but uh, I wouldn't want to be in your situation yeah. having to figure out how to balance yeah. it but I appreciate your your support. Well thank you and uh, look forward to um, yeah the what we come up with that at the next meeting so thank you so much. Great. Thank, thank you. you. All right cheers. Um, okay, so now we're, we're going to move to the, um, yes, to uh, the project manager recommendation. Um, and for this, I assume I'm turning things over to, oh, to Cameron? No, just Jennifer has her hand up. Oh, Jennifer, yes, go ahead. And then it'll be Mike. I'm sorry, I need to, I need to go. It's okay, thank you. Have a good I'm, night. My medicine is kicked in, so I got to go. <laughs> good, good. Good night. All right. Good night. Um, yes, Jack. This might, we only have a couple of items left on the agenda, but the, but we've been going for kind of a long time without a break. Uh, like 
not quite two hours, but it might be a good time for a break, for a short break. Other thoughts? Break? Yeah, okay, I'm seeing some nods. I'm sorry. Um, 10 minutes, five minutes? Can we do five? Okay, five minutes. We'll reconvene, 10, 15. And then... <laughs> and so we're gonna bring it back together here. All right, I'm gonna turn it directly over uh, to you all. Go ahead. All right, I'm Mike Miller, Planning Director for the city. Josh Durham, Community and Economic Development Specialist for the city. All right, so really quickly, what we're here to talk about is the uh, 203 Country Club Lane, the Elks Club property uh, project manager recommendation approval. So we did put out an RFP for a project manager um, to continue our planning process. We received four applications. We narrowed it to two, had interviews, and we have come up with uh, a unanimous uh, recommendation to council. Uh, the firm, uh, it's going to be led, uh, the recommendation was led by White & Burke, uh, who's a real estate um, brokering firm in Burlington, and uh, they'll be working with uh, VHB and Black River Design um, to try to go and do the planning process. So. Uh, what really stood out to, to us about theirs was, first of all, their timeline. It's a very rapid timeline. So they're looking at uh, nine, about nine to 12 months for the planning process. Uh, they're hoping for about nine um, to try to get through that initial planning so they can start working then on the preparation. Uh, we did ask them about uh, the potential of groundbreaking. Uh, would that happen in 2024? Uh, and, and in the spring, that would be 18 months from now. They said that might be a little aggressive um, because we would need the funding and such, but it wouldn't be impossible to see stuff start to happen two years from now in the fall. So um, just something to keep in mind. That's what their timeline is when they're working with us is they're looking at a two-year timeline um, to, to be able to start working on um, implementing what gets approved by council, hopefully sometime in the middle of the summer next year. Uh, so the funding has, uh, I believe it's in the report is, uh, we've identified the funding. If there's any uh, additional costs that come up, we'll be working with Bill and finance to, to see either, because it's ending so close to a fiscal year, it may be something that gets rolled into a following fiscal year that we'll talk about during budgets, but it's in, in what we had approved uh, for a budget of 150,000. Okay. Questions? Uh, no. Okay. Comments from no one. Well, the <laughs> public here. Uh, okay, Peter Kelman, go ahead. Maybe Peter's hand was left over from the previous discussion. Oh no, no. You oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Um, I, I, I read I read all the proposals and I can certainly understand why you would have selected this one. I, I think I probably would have also. I do have one question. This is the same group that is representing VCFA in their uh, selling their property plans. Now, probably a different department, a different group of people, but I hope that in talking to them, you'll make clear that you hope there's not any conflict of interest um, with that. That's gonna be another large property that could be have multiple uses just like this one. There might be synergies perhaps, but we want, but you need to make sure there's not gonna be a conflict of interest. That's my, own, that was my only concern. Otherwise, I thought it was clearly the, the best proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other, yes, uh, Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, I also like this proposal um, a lot out of all the ones that I read, and I'm a little bit familiar with the organization. I know that they do really good work, so I have a lot of confidence in them. Um, so my my only input would be about the public engagement part, and I know that that is a that is a sticky, tricky thing for people to do, um, and it looks like they have it kind of blocked out as one element they're going to do for three weeks and then they're going to move on to to other things so i would be so much more comfortable seeing it more integrated throughout the whole the whole thing so if you could encourage them to do that or talk with them about that i would also um 
ask you to consider encouraging them to think really creatively and seek out some different, some alternative sources for how to engage the public? Because I think we're pretty good at putting things on front porch forum and putting things on our meeting agendas and posting something on the city website. And there's a whole ton of people that that doesn't hit. Lot, people who will never come to a public meeting, people who aren't going to come to a Zoom meeting. And there are ways to get in touch with those folks. There are ways. And I, I'm not an expert in it, but I know that there are a lot of people who have done a lot of really good work on public engagement processes, processes that are really citizen driven, that really um, meet people where they are and not just asking them to come to us. So all that stuff is great. We got to do all of that. Um, but we have to do a lot more than that as well. And I guess I would say our observations, your observations um, were the same as ours, all, all four of us. And so um, when we contacted them, after we decided um, that we wanted to select them, our one concern was we wanted them to um, enhance their public input uh, process. And so they gave us a number of things. They're gonna be bringing on uh, a specialist from their organization who's going to then go and help to uh, expand the public input process beyond what you see in the application. Great, great. It was the same thing we saw. Okay. Um, any uh, comments that you have about um, Peter Cummins' suggestion or thoughts around the... So, the so yeah, go ahead. We, we actually, you know, they have had experience working in the city. They were our partner on the, the parking garage project. They've been advising us on TIF. Um, but with Sabin's pasture, they're familiar with the city. Um, we saw that as a plus. I mean, obviously they're different projects, but the fact that they were doing market studies of what was flying in the city, that they were understanding what the needs were, um, you know, we wouldn't want to duplicate or be competing. And so the fact that we had, you know, that there's a, a single, um, that, that it's the same firm, I think will bring, in, inform both processes. So we, we, I mean, I think it's fair and we have, I talked with them about it actually before they even submitted, they wanted to know what I thought about it and that was my take, but um, uh, you know, we, it's a good point that he made. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Lauren. I agree, this proposal looks great, um, totally support it. Just um, one note on Carrie's suggestion uh, this morning, the social and economic, Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee was talking about this project and that we could potentially bring some ideas because working with creative discourse, there had been a whole process of affinity groups and some things. So would love to um, just, if there's a way for us to kind of interface with this person who's gonna be running the public uh, process, we could share you know, what we've learned through our equity work on some um, ways to engage the community. Great. And our city's own communications person will be working on this as well. It won't be all just them. So great. Okay. Um, Jack. I move that we approve the contract, uh, awarding the contract to White and Burke. Okay. For the discussion. Uh, not seeing any. Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. So that is unanimous. So we do not need to do roll call. Um, and Jennifer's not on, right? So oh, thank you so much. Um, you. Yeah, look forward to yes. seeing how it goes. Public process. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Um, all right, I would also suggest that um, we not take up the, where did it go? The uh, park that ordinance uh, first reading. And I think it's late and there's nothing really, Uh, I mean, I feel like if we want to give people a real chance to, to weigh in, I think we probably should put it off for now. Um, yeah. So I would say if we're going to put it off, which is fine because it's not urgent, although it will again, be. <laughs> the sooner the sooner we can do it, the sooner we can give people advance notice to be prepared. But I did note in the memo, and you know, Mike's here that um, planning and DPW really took a good look and kind of redrafted it from the earlier draft that you saw. I personally feel it's a much better version. But if anyone has any concerns about that, you know, if you could let us know in advance, so we, so we can be ready to address it at the first hearing instead of 
having to redo it. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I really appreciated the work they did, but you know, it is, it is different than what you saw, although I don't think the content is that different, but just so mm -hmm. that would help, okay. help us move it along. Okay, great. Uh, any further conversation about anything? Okay, uh, all right, so um, with that, um, uh, we'll go to the reports and it lists the mayor's report first. And my gosh, am I prepared? Um, well, you can change the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I could. Uh, uh, I would. Uh, so I, it's been a little while since I um, had at least advertised that I'm doing office hours. If folks would like to have office hours um, with me, it'll just be virtual. So just email me and I will get you a link to, um, to have a time to chat. And that would be Sunday at 2 p.m. Um, so Sunday, 2 p.m., folks are interested in um, having a conversation. I would, I would love to do that. Um, and that is going to be it for me for right now. Donna. Yes. Connor. Yeah, no, I, I just want to say, uh, you know, but election night was nice, but uh, my, my mother passed away the same day. Uh, so it was kind of a whiplash day. But I just want to thank everybody for reaching out. It was uh, yeah, pretty, pretty difficult week, but I really appreciate all of you. So yeah. thanks very much. Yeah. Um, Jack. Yes. Um, I wanted to comment on something that I've noticed on Facebook lately. I noticed both uh, the, the, the Montpelier Police Department has been uh, much more active posting on Facebook, posting on uh, different law enforcement activities uh, they've been doing. And other neighboring uh, police departments have been doing the same thing. And I want to say that I really appreciate and support the decision that Montpelier Police Department has made to uh, when they post that they've, uh, they've done something and they've made an arrest that they have not been publishing the name of the person who has been arrested. And I think this is a really good thing for a couple of reasons. One, when the person's arrested, they're still innocent. You're innocent until proven guilty. And so, uh, so why should we be putting someone's name out there and making the whole world think they're a criminal when they're innocent? Um, two, why I think it's definitely in the public interest to have the public know what the police is do, are doing, but why publicize the worst moment, well, maybe the worst moment of someone's life if we don't need to um, the choice not to publicize the pe people's name is really uh, part of uh, our public policy of restorative justice. And uh, so I think uh, good job doing that. Yeah, uh, Lauren. Um, just wanted to remind people um, that uh, we had several appointments tonight and lots of committee appointments we do have our stipend program so um, please know that you stipends are now available for participation in city committee work um, so please uh, look at that apply get involved um, and would also just wanted to note that um, you know I mentioned that the social and economic justice advisory committee was talking about the um, the Elks project as a place where we could um, look at public engagement and we're also doing kind of prioritization right now. So if there are projects that um, you all as counselors being on many of these committees or you know anyone um, who is serving on those think could be a good place for um, you know, where the expertise of that group could be helpful or we're, you know, weighing in, um, looking at the equity implications of different actions the city is taking. We're definitely interested in trying to kind of collect ideas and set some priorities for the upcoming year. Um, so would welcome that kind of input. Um, the only other thing that I've gotten a couple communications from, from various folks about the, some of them are now outdated, but um, about the parking ban, like the winter parking ban. And I feel like normally we talk about that post spring and I feel oh, like we didn't really do a debrief. Yeah, we didn't do a debrief and like 
I feel like sadly winter's going to be here before we know <laughs> school starts tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. So if, you know, maybe it's just, we look at the updated policy at this point and do the debrief all together, but it just was on my mind that we never kind of mm -hmm. looked at the lessons learned and definitely got a good amount of input during the winter about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to take a little prerogative and add to mine, um, which, which is to say that I, I'm very grateful for the support of the voters of Montpelier, um, having won uh, the, gotten the highest number of um, votes for support for state Senate in the Democratic primary um, from Montpelier was significant. Um, that was very helpful. And I'm very grateful um, for, for everybody's support. And uh, yeah, thank you. Congratulations to you and Connor. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, John. Oh, uh, just well, might as well mention that I have already updated the ordinance on the uh, on the website. So. Already done. Yeah. Boom. Isn't there a certain number of days before it's? Well, finished? no, the the days are indicated in there, but the document is updated. And I just, okay. just wanted to say right. it's up there. After all that, it's it's now official. Okay, Bill. I actually have a list, um, so I'll try to get through them pretty quickly, but uh, quite a bit. So number one, I, I did send you out this information earlier. I think today or yesterday, but we. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, is that better? I'm not. It's any any more? I'm be eating it. Um, I'm vibrating. Okay. Um, so, uh, we sent this out. We unfortunately did not get the Northern Builders grant for district heat. Um, so that is a shame. Uh, we put in hats off to Cameron and our staff for really putting a ton of work into that grant. Um, I think, you know, at least in the letter we got, they really emphasized that they were looking for economic development projects. Um, that was their real key priority. So, um, these are, none of these are in particular order. The Housing Task Force is looking hard at sheltering options for the winter. Um, and they, uh, as a, you know, you approved the, the grant at the last, actually tonight, you approved the contract for them to move forward with their, um, their plan. That's gonna be a, a big step, but uh, right now, you know, there was no plan to shelter uh, at Christchurch again, because there's no one on it. So uh, we are, looking at that and looking at the costs. Um, so more to come on that. Um, speaking of sheltering, the comment was made earlier tonight and um, I didn't wanna get into it because we were talking about something else uh, about sheltering. Uh, just a reminder that the city put $100,000 into the new shelter in Berlin. Um, so it was not um, a neighboring town, simply taking care of the actual regional partnership and we were one of the major contributors. Um, in response to that general comments of that individual, we do do follow up to the general business every Friday. So we don't get into back and forth here, but if people have questions or raise issues or comments in the weekly menu, I do respond to that. I know you all know it. If there's somebody still watching, I wanna make sure they knew that, that we don't just ignore it. Uh, let's see. Main it, what do you mean post? Weekly memo. Could you somehow make it a public statement there? Sure. Or, or maybe at the end of public comment. Because I know. wouldn't have. I mean, you mentioned that, but I don't think it's really live. Right. Well, public's mind. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Just Main Street paving is going to be a big job. That's going to start uh, next Monday. You may hear about this. It is right after school starts. We um, we made all efforts to have this done prior to school starting. Uh, due to some permitting con you know, conflicts with the contractor, they're going to start Monday. They have agreed to not start work until 9 a.m. So all the morning commute will happen. Uh, basically, it's a two-day morning and filling thing. So what's going to happen is on Monday, next Monday, they're going to start at the roundabout, go past the middle school and go up Main Street toward Town Hill and do that side of the road. They're going to stop when they finish. And then they're going to do the exact same thing on Tuesday. So both days, they will be starting after the morning commute and by the afternoon, we will be some detours. It's not going to be perfect, but they should be up the hill and out of the school zones. Mechanical uh, 
problems or whether uh, it's kind of things, but that that is the plan. Uh, we and they've been really good to work with. And then the final paving is going to actually occur on a Saturday um, to avoid school conflicts. So, and that's by September 10th. So that project will be completely done by September 10th. That's going to be a long stretch of road. Uh, East State is still moving along. And then again, um, all the work is on our website and on the weekly memo that uh, DPW has been really uh, active and our, our staff has been really active at getting the word out about what's happening, but there are a lot of projects happening. Um, unfortunately, we've got a couple of hiring processes underway um, and the building inspector, assistant city manager. Um, so if you know anybody that would be good at either one of them, let us know. Um, and then lastly, I do want to mention talking about hiring um, because, and I, I, this is big. Um, you know, we really are, are, are getting to the point of really um, emergency crisis shortages in police and pretty close to that in DPW. Uh, they, they're really reflecting the, um, the nationwide situation. You know, police, uh, police, I think you're just having struggles anyway. And in, in DPW, you know, um, if you have a CDL and experience running heavy equipment right now, uh, contractors are scooping you up left and right at top dollar. Um, so it's becoming it's becoming a crisis as far as getting work done. So we're in conversations with both departments about how to address that. And one of the ways to do that is to revisit their contractual wage agreements. So you may hear more about this. I wanted to make sure I said that and said it in public that we, we have longer term agreements with both these unions uh, and we are looking at perhaps having to reopen them. Obviously you would be involved in that. Um, and you know what that costs, where the money comes from, all of that. But um, it's gonna be that or a choice between not delivering our essential services because we don't have anybody to do it. And so we have a little choice, we'll have impacts on next year's budget, um, but it's probably, the biggest, most stressful thing that's on our office's desk right now. So, so have a good evening, everybody. <laughs> oh gosh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, keep us, keep us posted. I'm sure it will be. All right, so I think that is the end of our business. So without objection, um, we will adjourn 1037. Thank you, everybody.